Hello and welcome to another episode of the Libre Podcast. I think this is episode four. It's been a while since I did a Libre Podcast, but this is going to be the new and improved one because I have a co-host now, Mike. Yeah. Who, I, um, people, people may already know who I am yeah, if, some, if they're, like, they're long time. They'll know if they're if they're longtime watchers of the channel and more specifically if they watched the archery content that I made on YouTube before the cops in Boston shut that down. <laughs> I don't think I've ever talked about that publicly before. I, I you know what that's actually worth talking about. We're talking especially, about that now? Yeah, especially now that I don't live there and so it's not really a, a doxing risk or anything. Um, Malden PD <laughs> constantly coming out to, um, well, see, it's not even their fault, right? Because where I was living up north is, I guess, a relatively nice neighborhood. Like, it's not the nicest neighborhood. It's not the highest, like, uh, you know, end highest income bracket or whatever, but it's a pretty nice place. So... The police don't have that much to do out there. And so when someone calls them, especially if they're because because I, I never got a recording of the 911 calls. But, you know, black man with a bow, you got to show up to that. <laughs> yeah, you can't. I, just... I don't know if it was a 911 call because if it was 911. Well, non-emergency. Like, non yeah. Yeah. You yeah. would have had the fire department and ambulance there, too. Right, right. So not so non-emergency calls. Yeah. I'm concerned because there's a there's a bearded brown man. There's ISIS with a bow. And Hamas is here with the bow. Right, yeah, Hamas. That's right. We got to be contemporary. Hamas is here with a bow, and I feel threatened um, because he's shooting a target in like in a field. I mean, it's a cemetery, but it's yeah. not like. It's not like someone's grandma is there. The youngest person in that cemetery probably died in the early 1800s. It's yeah, like, it was a it's like a Revolutionary War cemetery. So no one's been buried there in like 250 years. Yeah, no one's been buried there. Nobody really goes in there. I mean, I guess maybe some teenagers will go in there at night to like drink or smoke weed or whatever. But in the in the middle of the daytime, no one's there. And yeah. we also had a backstop because even um, what was it? The sergeant. That was the whole point. Yeah, when the sergeant came out, I don't think you were there when the sergeant came out. That was the last time I was allowed to <laughs> shoot in there. But he came out and he's like, yeah, you have like a six or seven foot backstop, like a little dirt hill behind it. So there was no danger. But yeah, we would get the police called on us so many times. Mike had to come out. Mike, Mike had to be, you know, the, the white designated man. white man for safety reasons. <laughs> It's not even like they would they would tell us to go away. Like they would just come out and like just watch us shoot for like a minute and a half. Well, those were the cool. Those away. were the cool ones. Yeah, because yeah. there were some cops that like they really don't give. They don't really care. But the last time that I was able to do it, there was a guy that came in and he actually talked to me over the intercom. His like little you know inside his car, and he was like, "Stop doing that." <laughs> so I put my bow down and I asked him like, "I can't." do this and he's like no and i said why not and i think i'm i probably name dropped like two or three other cops because at this point i had the names and the business cards of almost every cop that was at malden pd and so i'm i'm asking them you know are you sure i can't do this because i'm not i'm not hurting anybody it's it's not um it's not like this is really dangerous or anything like that i have the backstop etc cetera, etc cetera. so he's like let me call the sergeant right so Sarge comes out and agrees with me about that. But here's what I didn't know. So behind the scenes, the chief of police for Malden, city of Malden, was changing. Because that guy that goes to our gym, that older dude that always wears the... Yeah. Well, your gym now. It's not my gym anymore. But yeah, that was the old chief. And the new chief was... Um, I want to say Conan was his name because he was a captain before and then he became the chief and he said that he didn't want me doing that anymore because of the amount of people that call and my That's whole thing was like why don't you tell these people that they're idiots that they're, exactly that they're like because because here's the thing right so 
it's, um, you know, me and him were arguing over the phone about this a little bit, about how um, it's, it's a dangerous projectile or, or whatever like that. I was like, look, man, there's people that play golf at not that place, but the dog park. People go to the dog park yeah. and they would treat that like a basically like a driving range because there's no holes or anything like that. It's just you hit the golf ball out into <laughs> just just out into wherever. And that's a much more active place. Like there's there's a playground there where little kids go play. Uh, there's a dog park. There's a like soccer field and stuff like that. So this is a much more active place where people are hitting golf balls. And when you're driving a golf ball um for one well you could probably you play golf how how far are you slinging a golf ball so i i know what park you're referring to and like i don't yeah. think they were doing driving is that that you, you can you can really hit a bar, ball like at least like 250 300 yards you know um yeah if you're like a pga person you can get the 350 range i've seen like dudes there i've seen dudes yeah. they're hitting golf balls and like granted like they, weren't, there. they weren't hitting it as hard as they could like so yeah. i guess driving isn't the right word but they were definitely hitting golf balls and, and the point i was gonna make is i'm pretty sure that my shot placement with a recurve bow is more accurate than they are with a golf ball yeah i mean you know, they were like, out there with like a nine yeah. iron or like an eight iron which doesn't go that far but like still you could hit someone with that yeah so we were kind of going back and forth, and he's like, oh, but an arrow is more dangerous, and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, basically, uh, it came down to me no longer being allowed to do archery. And that's one of the big reasons that I decided to move down here. I mean, um, rent was a really big one, because my rent went up to like 2100 So it's a lot cheaper living down here in Virginia. But yeah, just I'm paying all this money to not have any freedom. <laughs> that's that's kind of the realization that I had. Um and uh well I would say overall I just wasn't that big of a fan of living in Massachusetts anyway. Yeah. But yeah, this is where why I'm preparing guys... to become a refugee. Yeah. Yeah, th this is that's where you guys know Mike from. Uh let me go ahead and store my camera and stuff back. That's where you guys know him from. So he's gonna help me out with the podcast and he also has a YouTube channel. Well, you recreated your YouTube channel, right? Because you had the Sir Sudo yeah. channel. I used to be Sir Sudo, and then I deleted it because I originally wanted it to be like a side job that I just made money from. Uh, and then, long story short, the, the feds, not the real feds, like a subsequent federal agency, offered me a bag, and I was like, okay, cool. Uh, and then I had like no desire to make YouTube videos anymore, but then now I kind of do. I, I want to do more repair shit. So I made a new channel that I'm going to be uploading less frequent than Sir Pseudo, but I'm still going to be around and doing kind of more chill, like Lewis Rossman, but if he was not always 100% on Adderall. <laughs> hey, man, I mean, Adderall is, um, that's like the, probably the number one drug of the corporate world behind caffeine. You know, yeah. Wasn't wasn't know. there a guy I, that, I, that I cannot shot confirm. I cannot confirm uh, or deny Adderall usage on Lewis Rossman's <laughs> part. I'm just gonna slip that. I don't out. even know if he does do it, but Love I, I just Lewis. always feel like he's. I just feel like he's always a hundred percent all the time. Yeah. He's never like. What Mike meant to said is he wants to be Lewis Rossman if you ordered Lewis Rossman on Wish. That's that's what <laughs> Mike meant to say. He's your Dollar Tree Lewis Rossman with his 720p webcam. <laughs> You know how old this webcam is? Is that it still has the old Logitech logo, like the one that looks like that, oh. you know, like that Native American symbol without the G that's split yeah. up. Yeah, I don't know. I have a Logitech cam too, but yeah, I it's, I've, I've had this since like 2016, and I've never used it. Tisk tisk. Well, now it's getting some good usage, right? It is, yeah. And if you uh, actually do end up becoming uh, Lewis Rossman from Wish <laughs> and making some money with content creation, you can, uh, I guess it's not a tax write-off since you didn't buy it this year, but you can get a new one that's Again. modern and- They're probably happy. cheap nowadays, aren't they? They are. They're like, they're like less yeah. than a hundred bucks. Well, I sent you, I sent you links a couple weeks ago. <laughs> we were talking I didn't get a GoPro. I end, I end, the Zoomer ended up sending me a GoPro, finally. Nice. Yeah, the the repair because you were already selling stuff on 
uh, eBay, right? Yeah. There might be somebody out there with a mic computer, a refurbished mic computer. But you could try selling them on Base.Win. I think that I you am. might be able to offer um, maybe a better a better win-win. Because I've never sold anything on eBay, but I think there were some things you were saying telling me about how... Um, what was it? When, when you're a seller on eBay, apparently it's easy for customers to like buy stuff from you and then return it way later and it's basically and you have to pay the shipping something like that yeah the this the buyer gets a lot of preference in those transactions so they, they can claim x y and z doesn't work and if you dispute it the ebay is more likely to align with the buyer than the actual seller um and it's really, I mean, eBay's fees How are much of a high. percentage do they take? Because, I mean, obviously they take a percentage Gosh, since they're giving you like, a selling platform. I think it's like 12.5. What? 12.5. Yeah. 12.5, yeah. That's a lot. It is. That's more than 10%. Which is That's why, so and the, the better part of selling it on base.win is I can actually install Linux on it. Like, I have to install uh, fucking Windows on these laptops. Really? You, uh, can't, sell, you can't sell Linux laptops? I can. I oh, can, but no but one will buy it because yeah. normies. Yeah, it's all normies yeah. on fucking. <laughs> and people are going to be buying Linux on on eBay. Um, well, actually, which... one one thing I have seen on eBay is um, I've seen a couple people selling Libre booted ThinkPads on eBay. Yeah, I actually just got a huge crate of uh, of ThinkPads. There's uh, I have a family friend who has been in. I don't know if it's government. Some sort of government agency, not a government, like not a real government agency, but like a government adjacent agency, like myself, for fucking four years. So, so your CIA uncle dropped off a crate full of ThinkPads. <laughs> she, had, she, had like a, she had like a like a banker's like box okay. full of ThinkPads. Yeah, like like a banker's box full of full of ThinkPads. So, if you want to buy them, some, I'm totally one of them was not. a power PC. One of them was a fucking power PC. <laughs> So if, if you guys want to buy some, some totally not backdoored uh, ThinkPads from Base.Win that have been I'm a Libre with them anyway. <laughs> some totally not backdoored Libre booted ThinkPads from Base.Win. I should, I should before, before your audience thinks that I'm a Fed, I should say that I'm not directly working for the Feds. I work for one of those government adjacent. No, but your aunt uh, is. But your aunt is. We, we met up in Langley for coffee. So your aunt is definitely <laughs> CIA <laughs> and uh, has totally backdoored those thick pads. But um, anyway, uh, his so I, I don't forget if I mentioned it already, but his um, YouTube channel is called The Employed Linux User. Yes. OK, awesome. So let's start getting into what we have news wise today, content wise, uh, as you guys know. Hamas attacked Israel. Uh, how many weeks ago was that now? Two or three weeks ago? Seems like it's been maybe. Yeah, two weeks ago. ago. Two weeks ago. Two okay. weeks ago on the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So they they did this attack on the weekend, and there there were a number of things about it that um, I guess Israel just wasn't ready for because Israel's got this Iron Dome defense system, which is primarily calibrated for rockets and things like that not a dude on a paramotor <laughs> so yeah they didn't account for the fortnite strategy <laughs> yeah they didn't account for the fortnite strategy where just a guy on a i, I saw the video of it on uh, maybe cnn or something like that it's like a, a guy decked out with um some military gear and apparently those paramotors they can carry like 500 pounds on them so yeah that's the same kind of shit of they use in the uh and like the bayous and the swamps of Florida down south, like those, uh, what do they call them, pond skippers? Or like. Well, this you was. Know, I'm, pretty sure this was like a, big... I'm pretty sure this was a paramotor. So, a paramotor, to my understanding, it's basically a lawn chair <laughs> with a giant fan. Yeah, isn't on that the, the same fan they use on those like pond skippers? Like it's like basically like a floating piece of wood, and they have like a giant. Yeah, fan yeah, back. yeah, yeah. Okay, I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah, so it's it's like that, but you know, in the air instead of aquatic, and yeah. it has like a like a parachute. That's how you fly. Yeah, is this fan like catches air into your parachute, and it's 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 probably the 
cheapest um what's what's the word like cheapest aviation vehicle like like if you're like i want to be a guy who flies and you're like hang gliders aren't good enough you know squirrel suits aren't good enough because that only works if you i i think it's the cheapest and simplest um aviation vehicle that launches from the ground that's probably an accurate statement Apparently. It unironically is probably the stealthiest too, because it doesn't actually. Because you're flying at such I don't a think altitude. it's the stealth. No, 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 at no. At least, no. at least from at least it's... from a at least from like a a, a macro point of view, because you're flying at a pretty low altitude, so you're Maybe. not going to come up on a radar. <laughs> well, here's I mean, the you're going to be easily seen from the ground, but if they're not expecting you, then you at least have some lead time because they won't see you on a radar. It's but if the... they do see you, you're going to get blown out of the sky pretty easily. It's it's the perfect example of you need to have the right tool for the job, right? <laughs> so historically, what Hamas does is they get um, they get rockets, right? They get they get missiles and and some stuff like that. That I don't know. They probably buy it from Russia or China or wherever. They get it on the dark web with Bitcoin, and um, they shoot these rockets into Israel, but Israel, like I said, has the Iron Dome, which really is American technology, so, you know, it's top-notch, and it shoots those rockets down very efficiently, and apparently it's like, um, if you're, like, I guess a teenager, like, you're in your 20s in Israel, a, a romantic thing to do is to take your date out onto a ledge and watch the Iron Dome, because it's, like, fireworks or whatever. You know, it's one of those things where, um, when the Iron Dome, people in Israel are so confident in the Iron Dome that when it's shooting down these rockets, they're apparently just pretty chill. They're, it's it's like Californians when an earthquake happens or people in Boston when there's a blizzard. It's like, oh, yeah, it's just another day. But it's not calibrated for a dude on a paramotor. Um, but as far as stealth goes, if they would have had, you know, this is a probably multi-billion dollar system. If you just have a few good old boys that have duck hunting equipment, <laughs> like they have their shotguns with birdshot. Oh, they could fuck Hamas up, man. They would be shooting. They shoot him down. Literally oh, yeah. that dude. If I saw that dude flying over my farm, he would be fucked. <laughs> Oh yeah, I that was like Alabama. Down so easily. Like that would have just been a normal day of duck shooting. Because paramotors aren't very fast. They go how how fast are they anyway? We should you should Google it real quick. How fast loud... paramotors? Okay. Yeah, how fast is I mute myself? Yeah, with your loud ass uh, keyboard. Worry, <laughs> I bet a paramotor doesn't go faster than twenty miles per hour. According to uh, Cirex, it's between twenty five and thirty miles per hour. Okay. And and you know what? I just remembered too. That's probably they can, more advanced paragliders can reach up to 50 miles per hour by engaging the trim and speed bar systems. And I bet you that speed when it says 25 to 30, I bet you that's their speed when they're diving. Like going down. I bet you if they're mm. flying uh if they're flying flat or if they're trying to gain altitude, I bet you it's it's not even that fast. So there's there's and and if you were flying over my i mean i'm just thinking about how my farm's laid out the trees are so high that you know if you're coming in you gotta go in and if i shoot you there's no way you're getting back up and clear those trees so yeah they they just did not have the right tools uh for the job and so they were able to do a terrorist attack that i was reading was something like it was some order of magnitude larger than 9-11 if you, like, did it per capita. Because Israel is a much smaller state. So, yeah, they're really pissed. I mean, you got to think if, assuming you were alive uh, during 9-11, I mean, I was a kid, but I remember how, um, I guess, sentiment changed <laughs> after 9-11 towards, like, the Middle East and uh, towards, like, Arab people, Muslim people, everything like that. And yeah, America wanted blood. You know, we were, we literally invaded countries where the guys that did 9 11 weren't even from those countries. Like, I'm pretty sure 90% or something like that of the hijackers were Saudi nationals, but we're like, no, we get oil from them. Just, just, just hush, hush, ignore that. I, I think part of the problem, I mean, here, here's, my, here's, my here's my conspiracy theory. Here's my conspiracy theory for the day is Mossad is one of the, 
most advanced intelligence agencies in the world. Like maybe one or oh, two, yeah. depending on how well you view the FBI. I well, hang on, not how not, the not fuck to not to did they just, not see any of this coming. I just want to I just want to interject for a second. You talk about how advanced Mossad is. If you look into how they went into South America and fucked up like old Nazis exactly. that managed to escape, like yeah. They've got some good intel, but again, their intel is shared with CIA, and you got to remember, Israel is our greatest ally. Okay, let, in fact, I'm going to full screen for this. This is important. <laughs> Israel Make sure they get the is our greatest ally. So yeah, um, they any anything that's like CIA wise, you know, um, any type of U.S. military tech, we you know give that stuff over to Israel. They test it for us. You know, in, in a way, I guess that's one of the potential win-wins is when we have some new military thing going on, uh, we can just send it, like, some new military thing we want to test, we can send it over to uh, <laughs> to Israel and let them test it for us or let uh, Ukraine test it out for us against the Russians. So, yeah, um, Hamas attacked Israel. They're very pissed off. And this is an example that ties in with big tech of how pissed off they are this is coming this is actually this is this is israel getting the eu to bully big tech on their behalf so this is a letter coming from um the Thierry brenton uh who is a member of the european commission and it says dear mr musk Following the terrorist attacks carried out by Hamas against Israel, we have indications that your platform is being used to disseminate illegal content and disinformation in the EU. You know, this this illegal content thing is interesting. I wonder what exactly they're sending uh, that's illegal. But anyway, let me remind you that the Digital Services Act sets very precise obligations regarding content moderation. First, you need to be very transparent and clear on what content is permitted under your terms and consistently and diligently enforce your own policies. This is particularly relevant when it comes to violent and terrorist content that appears to circulate on your platform. Your latest changes in public interest policies that occurred overnight left many European users uncertain. They're probably talking about that thing where um, anytime you uh, email Twitter for inquiry, they just hit you back with a poop emoji. Second, you received notices of illegal content in the EU. You must be timely, diligent, and objective in taking action or removing the relevant content when warranted. We have, from qualified sources, reports about potentially illegal content circulating on your service despite flags from relevant authorities. By the way, one, one thing I'm just going to interject here, because a lot of people have been asking me why I don't uh, sell stuff in Europe on base.win right now. This is part of the reason why. Like, it's, it's, um, in a lot of ways, what the EU is doing with big tech, like, I, there's some of the things I like, right? So obviously them with Apple, like, forcing Apple to use USB-C on their iPhones, I think is very based. But if you want to have an online store or any type of online service that, caters to eu customers there's a few more well quite a few more checks and balances required than doing it in the u.s and it's not necessarily that i can't comply with those checks and balances it's just way more work <laughs> that um and i've got a lot of stuff on my plate right now but uh anyway yeah this is uh and, and a similar thing was also sent to tiktok so it's just it's interesting how about one week after these events occur, we already have, you know, obviously Hamas is trying to spread their um, propaganda or whatever on, uh, online. And I'm sure some of it is true because here's here's one of the things that I've noticed with. Um, well, it's not even necessarily a terrorist tactic, I guess it's more of a gr maybe guerrilla warfare tactic. But, you know, Hamas has. There's innocent people that are living amongst Hamas, and it's not even necessarily the innocent people's choices, because what these guys will do is they'll attack a place, and then they go hide out in a hospital. Yeah. And so now it's like, okay, do I destroy this whole hospital and all the, you know, little children inside? And then if you do do that, Hamas will be like, oh, look at what they did to the poor, innocent children that had nothing to do with it, and they, they circulated on um, Twitter. So I wonder if that's... 
part of what they're talking about with the propaganda or if the if the propaganda is just completely false it's like 100 percent fake news that's uh made up by hamas but how how quickly they're like shut it down okay we have to shut down this stuff that's going online and probably part of it is uh because everyone's getting their news sources from online now, right? Yeah. Like if, if you can make something go viral on, on Twitter, it's so much more effective than getting something to go on uh, CNN or getting something on Fox News. That's what knock bombs are for. The only country in the world uses knock bombs. Yeah. It's a quote of my favorite YouTubers. Is, uh, first bomb means get out. Right. Second bomb means get out now. Third bomb means your fault. Oh, I didn't know there were three bombs. I thought I thought you just got two. You just got no, I think the there's, one. I think there's two to three, depending on it. Right. And you're talking mm -hmm. about when Hamas is is bombing. Yeah. Yeah. Different places with probably U.S. drones. I don't know. The I, I kind of agree with you on the EU. I think they do do some good stuff, but some things they take way too far. Uh, they're they're like a trying to be the cyber police. Well, it's like this chat control thing, right? So the EU is. <laughs> They're looking to approve essentially the end of private messaging and secure encryption because their whole thing, and this is something the U.S. does a lot too, where there's these encrypted messaging apps, um, Telegram, Signal, there, there's all these different things, and people do use them to commit crime. Right. There's um, obviously there's like phishing and stuff like that, although honestly, I don't, I don't think phishing and scams um, are necessarily as big a deal. But uh, one is uh, CSAM distribution. That's something that I always hear predator catchers talking about on Telegram. And um, it's the nature of these technologies is such that unless you make mistakes in other places, then it's really hard to catch somebody or it's really hard to to prove it right like if the police arrest somebody and they don't unlock their phone or they don't unlock their signal chat it becomes really difficult to prove anything that you that you have against um <laughs> people and actually this is this is exactly what it says in the um, second paragraph of this. So to find a majority for this unprecedented mass surveillance, the EU Council presidency proposed Tuesday that the scanners, so the, the, with these scanners, they're talking about scanning things, you know, in your app, and they only really work if they're able to scan things unencrypted. Uh, it would search all private messages and photos for suspicious content and report it to the EU. <laughs> Um, and well, they were saying in order to get the support, they were saying that, oh yeah, we're just going to scan for CSAM. That's it. Now I did a video talking about how scanning for CSAM is a very slippery slope. And here, here's the problem. Any model that you can create to, well, there's actually a couple of problems. So first is any model that you can accurately create to scan for CSAM is going to be very easy to adapt to scan for firearms or if you have say say something is made illegal right like if we go back to prohibition and we want to make alcohol illegal you can very easily see like oh yeah does somebody have a beer in this photo and now you can mark that as illegal activity and the second issue that you run into with csam and this has been an issue in, in almost every system where i've seen it implemented like i'm pretty sure um, OneDrive does automatic CSAM scans, so does Dropbox. Pretty much every cloud storage, like mainstream cloud storage, is going to scan for CSAM. And one of the issues is you'll have stuff that isn't CSAM <laughs> that gets flagged. And with, with CSAM in particular, that's one of those things where even if you're just accused of it, it really ruins your reputation okay if you're if you're not guilty right so if you're um what, what's the word when you're suspected right so you can be uh detained okay and you can even be arrested and put in jail and they're like we're gonna do your investigation but if it comes out that you're in jail for csam possession 
that's something where those uh, fellow inmate or you know fellow people in the holding cell they might beat you up or possibly even kill you. So it's it's a really serious matter, and I personally don't think doing automatic scams or automatic scans for CSAM is an effective way to stop it. What I personally think is more effective in in a lot of ways, big tech is kind of shutting it down and against this are the private sector predator catchers. So these are people like, um, I mean, it's even hard to name them because their channels get banned on YouTube all the time. But there's one guy, I think his, his channel is PP Southeast Texas. Um, I think his name's Alex. I, I forget his real name. But anyway, he, he said he goes by the name Gordon Flowers when he's doing uh, his videos. But guys like this are full time. Like, I'm pretty sure he, he makes enough money to do it full time, or at least I hope he does. They've got decoys that are in Discord. They're on Instagram. They're on Snapchat. They're on all these different platforms pretending to be a little kid. And with AI, it's apparently really easy to do that. I mean, you could probably take a, a picture of either one of us and make us into a little boy, possibly even a little girl, <laughs> right? And we could pretend to be a little kid on Instagram. And the thing is, in most states, just talking to a child that someone you suspect to be a child, so it doesn't even matter if it's really a kid or not, if I get on, you know, um, IG, right, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm a cute little girl, and you message me, and you're like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, I'm good. I'm 12, by the way. And you send me a dick pic. That's illegal. It doesn't matter that I'm really a dude in his 20s. Yeah. You sent who you suspected to be a little kid that. And obviously, the, the intent's there. So these guys, they will gather all this evidence on someone and they will get this person to actually try to meet up with a child who they suspect is a child. And then they do this kind of um, Chris Hansen style uh, talk. Although I really feel like that guy, Alex, is um, he's like a master of social engineering because I've, I've seen him do these catches where he he kind of pretends to be their friend. And it'll start off where somebody is denying everything. They're like, oh, no, that's not even me on Instagram. My account got hacked. And then towards the end of it, he's got him admitting to everything. He's like, oh, yeah, I've also got these hard drives at home with all this cheese pizza on it. And then the police come. And it's it's so satisfying when the police <laughs> come up because they, they walk in. I actually got to send you some of these because you'll probably get a kick out of these. The, the cop shows up and uh, he's like, hey, guys. Um, What's going on here? We got a call and Alex would be like, yeah, so we're, we're here with uh, Chester and um, you just got a little bit of child porn on your phone, right, Chester? Like like 10 or 15 pictures and they're right there in your gallery, right? <laughs> and you got a few on Telegram. He's like, yeah, and this is your phone here, right? And I didn't change anything on your phone, right? Okay. And he just hands the cop over to him and uh, I forget what his percentages are. I think he has like maybe a 50% arrest um, rate. It really depends on where you go, because I've seen some like I saw one where he was in California and um, <laughs> I mean, the laws as far as protecting kids in California apparently are a big joke. You have to I think you have to be in the kid for it to be illegal. <laughs> they have to catch you <laughs> like yeah, they catch you in the act. They have to catch you in the act or like some shit like that for it to be illegal. Um, and talking and all that crap is just like whatever. San Francisco PD just doesn't want to deal with it. <laughs> But um, I, th I personally think that is a way more effective method at stopping the distribution of CP and definitely stopping the distribution of people meeting up with kids is these, these people who are in the private sector, because I don't think cops really set up these stings that much anymore, or if they do, they only do it with big name people like Chris Hansen. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, Chris, he's still doing his thing. He's got, like, a new To Catch a Predator thing. But, he, you know, he can only do so many episodes, right? It's when you have this decentralized content creation thing where people can make To Catch a Predator content and actually make money off of doing it and, you know, do it in an honest way, um, I think it's a really good thing. But YouTube keeps banning these people. You know, Alex has been banned a number of times. Um, 
Someone else I used to watch called Colorado Ped Patrol, I think, got banned, but apparently he did a tax scam. He was uh, saying... He tried to be a little bit too based, fortunately. Yeah, he, I think he was saying his um, whole predator-catching operation was a non-profit, and it very much was a for-profit. And uh, he got in a little bit of trouble there. But what are your what are your thoughts? I mean, you're kind of on the same page as me. Yeah, speaking of um, the hashing algorithms that are used, like in cloud storages, I remember talking about this last year. Um, is Apple rolled it out um, in August of uh, of 2021, and the uh, the problem with with an algorithm like this is that you can have hash collisions between you know a picture that's actually CSIM like a picture of someone's dog. I don't right. think Apple necessarily it, did theirs with with hashes exactly, but it, it, it is was, still yeah. relevant though. If you're doing it that way, then yeah, it wasn't like one of the yeah, it, it was their own algorithm, but it was still a, a hash. And within like two weeks, someone found a hash collision that it was already possible. Jeez. So it's that that that's a possibility too. Is that is that the algorithm can flag something that actually isn't CSAM because of a hash collision, um, yeah. and that can lead to to some consequences that should not happen. And the, the AI stuff, even if you get, you know, AI, because AI is, is so popular now, to analyze these images and try to figure out whether it's CSAM or not, because hashes is only going to work for known CSAM, like stuff that's been floating around yeah, for that's years or whatever. Too. But the, the feds have to have a database somewhere. Of well, that, well that, that's a thing. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's even open source. Um, the hashes because that way because if you're running like an image board or something like that you've got to have some mechanism to stop people from just spamming cp yeah but how'd they get the hashes in the first place from people's hard drives yeah but they have to you i'm saying they probably, they probably is, have a hash they probably is an innocent have a, a data. database of photos somewhere well of course they, they the do hash from. yeah well of course they do the fbi ran playpen for like two weeks and during the time that they ran playpen they actually made it way more popular. I think the user base increased by about 500%. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Playpen was a CSAM site that was on the dark web. You know, they took, they, they had arrested the guy, but they seized, instead of seizing the server and just putting up the, you know, this has been seized by the FBI, they migrated it to their high bandwidth servers <laughs> in, in, you know, their headquarters or wherever. And, um... I don't have, like, hard facts to back this up, but I just know how... I, I know to some extent how sites on, like, marketplaces on the dark web work, and your user base does not magically increase by 500% without advertising somewhere. Um, now, I don't know where they would advertise at since it's a CSAM platform, and I'm pretty sure Dread doesn't allow you to, like advertise CSAM, but like on Dread, for example, when a marketplace wants to really start pumping their numbers up or like a new person comes into town, you pay the admins at Dread, which is Dark Web Reddit, a bunch of money, a bunch of Monero, and uh, yeah, they'll they'll advertise that for you. So um, I don't know where there there is there's one. Um, well, I'm not going to name it, but there's there's one uh, search engine that was on the dark web that accepted CP ads or CSAM ads because uh, they would put it at the top of your... And it was so annoying because you could search for something that had nothing to do with CP, nothing at all. And yet your first result, just like in you know Google, when they show you the ad results, first thing would be CP. And it's like, wow, yeah. okay. I don't really want this, a link to CP being on my screen. But um, I'm pretty sure that the feds contacted some service on the dark web that's like a cp ad service and probably sent them a bunch of bitcoin or monero to advertise that so not only did they further exploit children by running that site themselves but they probably enriched some pedophiles as well um in the process so yeah it's about your like, average tuesday for the fbi yeah right pretty much um oh and uh, I almost forgot the point I was going to make about AI. So AI scanning for, um, let's call it new CSAM, right? Stuff that doesn't have a hash for it existing. How do you get your AI to 
look at something and recognize that it's CSAM. Because I've seen AI look at something like a cat and say that it's a dog. You know what I mean? Because yeah. cause you got to think about it, right? With CSAM, you have to know that it's a kid, right? That it's, or at, at the very least, that it's someone under 18, because that's the, the rules for the U.S. And with some people that might be borderline, you know, where, where you can't really tell if it's someone that's of age or underage. And then you've got other stuff like, um, what do they call it? Lowly? <laughs> They've got that stuff where it's cartoons. And so cartoons yeah, actually, are... Actually, she's 2,000 years old, Kenny. She's 2,000 years old. Right. She's 2,000 <laughs> years old. Right. So, <laughs> so you've got that stuff. Um, where because it's drawn, it's not illegal because there wasn't a, you know, there was an actual child that was exploited. But what if you're a really good artist? How, how does the AI know that you're not a really good artist? So, yeah, like just automatically scanning people's photos. I, I think you're going to end up with false positives, which like I explained earlier, false positive with with CSAM is is it could lead to your death. <laughs> if you end up in a jail cell for yeah. that, um, it, there's, I don't think it's, it's going to bring more harm than good. <laughs> That's pretty much my summary on that. There's got to be some sort of manual review process, right? If like, if you get flagged for CSAM and it's obviously a picture of like your daughter. Well, it's funny you bring that like, up because yeah. on Facebook, they have manual reviews for that. And there's been, there's been a number of stories about um, the moderators on Facebook basically getting PTSD from the amount of just abuse material that's out there. And I think it checks out because I, I know you don't really listen to the Predator Catchers that much, but I do. And to be honest with you, like I know I mentioned Telegram, but a lot of the time these guys don't even end up using encrypted apps. I would say nine times out of 10, these people that are grooming kids that are sharing CP with one another, um, distributing CP, they're doing it on like the clear web, on the surface web. They're doing it on Facebook. They're doing it on Instagram. They're doing it on Twitter. And, and sure, these people probably get caught. But see, it also depends on where they're from. Because if you're like in, I don't know, Honduras, I'd imagine it's probably illegal to distribute CP in Honduras. I mean, maybe their age of consent is really low, but <laughs> it's Honduras. Like, we, we, there's dead people in the streets. There's rampant crime. Like, there's so much other stuff that the authorities there are probably focused on that they might not, like, even if Facebook is like, here's this guy's IP, here's his address. I don't even know if the authorities would necessarily do anything about it. So all they can do is ban you on Facebook, but then you come back. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that that stuff is really, really rampant. And so that's another reason why the end user device scanning, the completely outlawing encryption isn't even necessary to catch 99% of this. If Facebook and Instagram and um, I, apparently Twitter has shut it down to a large degree. Um, I haven't really looked into it and, and verified it too much. But I remember that was one of the main things Elon Musk was talking about when he took over Twitter is that uh, CSAM distribution was rampant and he claimed that they have shut it down for the most part. Yeah. I, I think part of the problem is that there's there's a, a shit ton of content out there. Like, have you heard of, um, of that shipping on YouTube? Not like actual CSAM, but like, you know, soft... So, not like actually, I don't like it's CSAM, but like sort of like softcore porn being on YouTube. Um, like if you search certain keywords. Oh yes, yes, yes! Yeah. I have heard of that. Yeah, apparently that's Luda actually exists. made a video about that. Yeah, I I haven't checked, but you're saying it's still because okay, so that's a perfect example, right? Where big tech is just dropping the ball. So some ordinary gamer, you know, Muda did a video about this. I might have done a video about it. It's foggy in my memory, because if I did do a video about it, it was over a year ago. And yet it's still a problem on YouTube. Even after changing ownership, Susan is no longer in charge of YouTube. It's a uh, Neil Mohan, right? Neil's not fixing it either. Yeah. I <laughs> so, just think it's a problem with the sheer amount of stuff that's on there. 
Yeah, like, it's how, it's probably like, how much content is uploaded every minute. Wasn't it there's something lot, like lot. like like fifteen minutes of content is uploaded every minute to YouTube? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Probably even more yeah. than that. Um, but you can, I mean, come on, pe people are reporting it. People make videos about it. Like, and there's even been groomers that are on YouTube. There was, there was a guy, and I remember watching his catch, who was, um, he was in Hawaii, and it was one of these deals where he was trying to say he's like the second coming of Christ or something like that. And, you know, when you're the second coming of Christ, God always tells you that you need to have like four or five underage girls as your wives, because that's just what you do. <laughs> and so this guy was in um, Hawaii trying to uh, basically do a David Koresh and um, he but he was actively doing it on YouTube. Like he's making these videos, like looking in the camera, all creepy, like pretending to be Jesus. And um, he was just on there. Someone, you know, Muda made a video about it and there was a predator catcher that caught him. But it took a long time after that video for that like exposure video coming out for his channel to actually get banned. In fact, I think he was arrested before he even got banned. So it's like, again, the predator catchers on YouTube are handling this so much better. So at the very least, YouTube could stop banning them because obviously the, the income is the motivation for these guys. I mean, I, a lot of them probably have some, like I think Tommy, the guy that did the tax scam, said that like his son was molested or something like that. So that was part of his motivation. But um people want to make money okay so if you cut off and not to mention like like forget making money but it's also expensive to do a lot of these catches because alex travels he's from i'm pretty sure texas but he's you know he's going all over the united states catching these people so putting gas in the car um paying people because they've got like two or three other guys that are operating cameras and they've got um there's some girls that are like decoys, but I think they decoy for a bunch of different people. Uh, and so they just, I guess, sit on Instagram all day, pretend to be a little girl, but you gotta pay them, right? I mean, if you want, if you want me or anyone else to pretend to be a little girl and talk to, that's the, that's the part that you, I would really want compensation for is talking to these guys. Cause that's creepy as hell, man. Like, can you imagine talking to a dude and he's like flirting with you? He's like, you know, talking to you like that and you're pretending to be a little kid. Like, how do you not just cuss him out and be like, dude, you're a sick fuck. I, I, I would at some point I'd end up doing that, but yeah. I guess you do have to get paid because you have to keep them in line in order for the person to catch them. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be more professional. So look at that. We're not even an hour into the podcast. And we already figured out a more effective way to save the children yeah. than the entire EU. You only get this at the Libre podcast, folks. All right, so our, uh, oh yeah, and this is, this is again, TikTok um, <laughs> warned by uh, the EU to shut down Hamas. So going back to the Hamas conversation, this is another um, news article that made me question the effectiveness of, I guess, censoring Hamas on uh, Twitter, because when it comes to, or, or all social media, because people fall for this stuff, right? So this is something that was um, tweeted by a verified person, although verifications don't make any difference um, these days. It says, Israeli helicopters getting smashed. And this is actually video game footage from Arma 3. Um, here, we actually have the video. Let's see. Music in this. Yeah, so this is video game footage. And, you know, people fall for it. So, so this is where, I guess it brings up the question of, obviously, if, if you're seeing video game footage and you think it's real, um, you're, you're a bit of a dunce. <laughs> you're, you're not the best at uh, looking into stuff and making sure stuff is real. Um, you're probably going to be the kind of person that pays your taxes and Google Play cards when an Indian man calls you and tells you that your car's warranty has expired. Do not redeem, madam. So, 
So this this is a this is one of those I guess moral questions is you know we have the internet and we're at the point now where social media like Twitter gets more views than probably every news station combined. In fact, the news is Twitter. Like if you watch CNN or Fox or whatever, they're literally talking about tweets that people posted on Twitter half the time. So this is sort of the informational hub. And everybody has a smartphone in their pocket. Most people have a computer. Yet, you know, it's, it's, we haven't evolved to, to the point where your average internet user is savvy enough to realize that they're being trolled by ARMA footage. So, um, do we treat the internet like um, the New Hampshire state motto, live free or die? Do we just let it be laissez-faire? Or do we regulate it? Because people, because it's for their own good. You see, you, you see where I'm coming from? What's the, what's the right option? Because we're too dumb to, to see some of us are too dumb. We're going to get scammed. We're going to look at a Hamas video and, and we're going to have our Jimmy's rustled. It's going to happen. And it's going to continue to happen over and over and over again. So I, I, re I really am a, a fan of the first method. I don't think that because regulation really never solves anything. It just usually ends up creating more problems in, in, in the back end. Um, I really think, I mean, I, you can call me an accelerationist. I think you just let it go, and then eventually the people who get scammed constantly will just end up not using social media anymore. Yeah. Because they'll just constantly get, get you know, their jimmies rustled. Uh, and the people who are capable of seeing what is fake and what is not will just end up, will just go about their day and continue using it. I mean, you, I mean, you also, like, it's not just some random person faking people out with, with armor footage. I mean, it could be, but you also have, like, state actors that do that shit, too. Well, you've got this There's probably dude. people in Hamas who are doing that just to rustle jimmies of people on Twitter or something. Well, I think Or hell, guy... even the IDF could be doing that just to, like, <laughs> you know, get some sympathy or something. Well, but, but hang on. No, 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 no. It's not propaganda when Israel does it. They're our greatest <laughs> ally. It's not, it's not propaganda. They're, they're our greatest ally. <laughs> it's not propaganda. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm on the same page. I mean, honestly, I almost see the, the internet as the reintroduction. It's like digital Darwinism, in a way. Because, yeah. and this is actually something I was thinking of earlier today when I was out on my farm. You know, that's when I have my philosophic moments <laughs> of how... When you think of ancient times, well, well we have this um, moral principle of respecting your elders, right? Like it's, um, I think it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? Or oh, no, it's honor your mother and your father, not necessarily respect your elders. But this is like a, it's like a moral principle. It's a religious principle, right? Respect your elders when somebody's older than you. Now, in ancient times, if you were an elder, as in somebody who's, we'll just say, over 60. You're probably pretty wise. You're probably a really smart person because in, let's say, pre-Rome, right? Before the Roman Empire, um, you probably would not make it. Most people would not make it to 60. Something's going to kill you off. Like, even if you get a disease like diarrhea, right? Think about how many people... And this is after the Roman Empire. Think about how many people in the 1700s died from diarrhea or like dysentery. Isn't dysentery basically just severe diarrhea, right? Like you're vomiting or something like that. Yeah, you die due to loss of uh, fluids. Right, yeah. loss of fluids. Nobody dies from that in the first world because we all have running water. You know what I mean? Like water, water is so available and abundant if you're in like a first world or you're in a developed place. So... Something like dysentery isn't going to kill you. Uh, food poisoning doesn't really kill people, right? Back in the day, it did. Oh, dude, if you ate some bad chicken in, like, the Roman Empire, that's like getting cancer, bro. Yeah, they, they believed a lot in, like, miasma, though. It was more of, like, they believed in, like, the bad air or, like, 
bad. Yeah, they didn't know. They had no. I mean, but yeah. even I shouldn't even bring up the Roman Empire because as recently as like the Civil War, doctors thought that doctors didn't wash their hands between surgeries because their logic was blood of the living is a good thing. And so if I smear a bunch of other dudes blood on you, then the chances of you living increase. Actually, you just gave me all that dude's STDs. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Not to mention STDs could kill you. Like, uh, what was it? Al Capone died from syphilis. Because if you don't treat syphilis, which, by the way, it's a penicillin shot. Okay, like you can, I'm pretty sure you can get penicillin at the pharmacy. Um, if you don't treat syphilis, it'll, you'll go crazy. <laughs> you know, your brain will just turn to mush and you'll be like, what was he, fishing in his swimming pool? You know, crazy stuff like that. So... The point is, in the modern world, getting to age 60 does not necessarily mean that you're a very smart person. It doesn't mean you're with it. It doesn't mean you're a wise person. So that's, to me, respecting your elders was always more about uh, wisdom. And I, I think this is something that's happening a lot, is we have, like, it's, it's probably a lot of old people that are falling for these scams, but they're old people who have been old in a world that's on easy mode relative to Roman Empire or even as recently as the 1800s. So a lot of these old people that we have wouldn't have made it in the 1800s because they would have eaten the raw chicken. They would have, um, or okay, we're talking about scams here, right? There were scams back in the day, but if you fell for them, and a lot of the time it was a lot more severe, right? Like if you fall for um, a fake medicine man, all right? Think about how that works. I roll into your town on a horse and buggy, and um, I've got snake oil, right? That's where the term came from, snake oil salesman. Now, who knows what snake oil is, okay? Like I saw a snake in my garden, uh, or not my garden, but where I keep my chickens uh, a couple of months ago, and he wasn't very oily at all. <laughs> They, they don't have, so I don't know what snake oil is. You know, maybe it's this puddle water <laughs> I just poured into my vial real quick. And uh, what's that, ma'am? You're pregnant and you want your baby to come out with blue eyes? Take my snake oil. And, you know, of course, it's probably going to kill you or make you have a miscarriage or whatever. But we're in horse and buggy days. I'm two towns over <laughs> at this point. I think point. more often than not, it was just heroin. Yeah, exactly. It's it's heroin yeah, it mixed like heroin with heroin or some other opioid. <laughs> Take this snake with oil, like sugar or something. Take this snake oil, which is um, a little bit of uh, opium, a little 1800s bit of formaldehyde. version of lean. It's a little bit of opium and formaldehyde mixed with puddle water. <laughs> the eighteen hundred version of lean. Yeah, so it's like, okay, if you get scammed in the eighteen hundreds, you're probably gonna die. But if you get scammed, and even the consequences a lot of the time are not that bad. So to me, it, it really seems like, I mean, I guess it isn't really Darwinism because if you get scammed, it doesn't stop you from breeding. But mm. man, the, the internet has grown so fast and people's ability to use it just has not kept up. And you know what a lot of it probably was too? In fact, I know that this is what a lot of it was. You know that there were people in the 80s and even the 90s, probably uh, like almost j like jock guys, right? Those those you know, jarhead type dudes who are like, oh, look at these pencil neck nerds and their Microsoft DOS sending each other, you know, text in a terminal over ARPANET. These losers. And now these guys run the internet, you know, in some way, shape or form, right? Somebody probably said that about Bill Gates. Yeah. When he was skipping class to play poker with people. And now these guys, they didn't keep up with uh, technology, and now they're in their 40s, and they're paying for their car's extended warranty with Google Play cards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think big tech or really anybody... So here's how, how it should go, right? If you manage to have kids, hopefully your kids are in tune enough with this so that they could be like, no, Grandpa, there's not hot singles in your area. Don't click that link. No, Grandma, don't, don't click... The, the, I don't know, coolcatvideos.biz. It's a trick. <laughs> don't go there. Don't trust any .biz domain. <laughs> or like MLMs or something. I feel like that's what, I feel like that's what a lot of women get into is MLMs. Yeah. yeah. 
to get into that multi mid or what is it multi level marketing? <laughs> so actually, like one of one of my there. friends, like my age, got almost got into an MLM. I like, almost got hired into an MLM. Uh, and he was telling like like I think we were on we were on a call one night, and he was telling us about it. And we were like, "Hey, bro, this sounds sounds a bit a bit sus." <laughs> Just saying. Uh, I heard about we this one. Called yeah, and then we and then oh, we eventually we eventually like convinced him to to get out of it and then after we researched it it was an mlm so it's not just old people falling for it like it's still young people i think more often now because a lot of them are uh they don't have the intuition to like actually read into stuff that you see on the internet right like you know you and i probably people who watch this podcast whenever you see something on the internet you usually don't take it with that much seriousness yeah and then if you want to you might like double check like look at the sources and actually go look and see if it's real um nowadays like if you go on tiktok and get your news there which god forbid but there's really no way to check sources so most of the time they just believe it because i don't know pretty blonde woman said that it was true <laughs> you know i think you're right because like um well you're you're technically a zoomer and i'm a millennial but um, I guess I, I don't really. But know. you're like, well, you're kind of a cusper though, because you're an older Zoomer. You're only a few years younger than me, so I really feel like I'll just say our generation was, and maybe Gen X as well. We're like the last two generations that really got deep in technology, right? Because okay, if you were a Gen Xer and you were in high school, you probably had something like a Commodore 64. My, my years might be off a little bit. But if you received a Commodore 64 and you learned it, which, like, you can basically program them yourself down to the hardware, you would have had a really good deal of competency with computers. I mean, that's what Terry Davis, um, like, with Temple OS, that's what he was trying to design, is, like, the modern-day Commodore 64 and I'm pretty sure that that was, like, his first computer or one of his first computers. And, like, that's how you become the type of dude who builds his own operating system and his own compiler and his own programming language completely from scratch and actually makes certain improvements on it. Like, I believe he improved the performance of, like, the switch statement in uh, C, which is like, hold... What? You made improvements to C? <laughs> As one guy, mind you, like, and, and he's not a PhD computer scientist or nothing like that. I mean, I'm sure he had a degree, but, you know, holy cow, brilliant. Um, but if you're a Zoomer or if you're, what's after that? I think Gen Alpha or anything after. What's your first computer? An iPhone? You can't even install a custom ROM on an iPhone. Or, like, can you even change yeah. your keyboard on an iPhone? You can change your keyboard. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. You could do that. Yeah, it's like, for me, I mean, my first, what was my first computer? I think it was that Acer Aspire laptop. And that was a single core, single thread, 512 megabytes of RAM running Windows Vista. And that poor thing could barely run Windows Vista. So what I had to do, like, I think I got that laptop for my birthday. And then for Christmas, I ordered a RAM upgrade. Now, for you as a, how old was I? Maybe 10 years old or 11 years old? For you as an 11-year-old to figure out what you need <laughs> to make your computer go faster when playing RuneScape, that's, that's a, and, and it was out of necessity. I mean, the other reason was also because I grew up, like, not super poor, but, you know, poor enough to where a dual core was out of the picture. My dad had a dual core. It was like a... It was some kind of Dell. It was a chunky boy, too. Uh, and it was like $1,000 <laughs> for a Core 2 Duo. Jeez. But, um... Yeah, like, I figured out... I figured out that RAM was the best thing to put into my computer to make it go faster. This was pretty much before SSDs and plus RAM. What, you didn't, you didn't download more RAM? I actually, I'm pretty sure that was something I looked into, like as as. A, but I'm ten, so you know I don't know better. Know. But it's like, yeah, download more RAM. How to add? Because I didn't know what RAM was, so I had to figure out what RAM was, and then I had to figure out the right kind of RAM. And you know, I, I had to figure all this stuff out as a kid. And again, my motivation was 
make RuneScape go faster so that I don't get immediately killed when I walk into the wilderness and there's more than like four monsters on screen and, you know, I drop to like two frames a second. And I mean, hey, that's a heck of a motivator, right? When you're when you're a kid, try to figure out how to make a game go faster. And that same motivation led me to install Windows 7. And as a, um, let me think, when did I install Windows 7? Maybe when I was like 13. As a 13 year old, I figured out how to torrent Windows 7 and flash it to a US, a flash drive with the command line, put it into my computer, go into the BIOS, <laughs> boot from that flash drive and then install Windows 7 myself. And then, man, I tell you, I felt like such a hot shot because I had Windows 7 on a flash drive and I was like going around like anytime aunts or uncles or something would come over and like they had a computer and they were complaining about because I'm pretty sure 7 had just come out and they're like, oh, this Vista sucks. I'm like, oh, I've got 7. And I'm sure it was probably backdoored Russian malware, but I felt so proud of myself. <laughs> Figured out how to install Windows 7 on my computer. And then later on, I installed Ubuntu because RuneScape was a game that you played in the browser and they had a client that I think worked on Linux because it's, it's Java, you know, it's a Java game. So why, why wouldn't it work on Linux? And Ubuntu did not use as much of my RAM on like the desktop. And I actually figured out that I could like disable more stuff because so well actually I'm getting ahead of myself when I was in Windows 7 I had gotten to the point where for gaming on Windows 7 and at this point I was trying to play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas on the same computer mind you single core single thread processor at this point we had two gigs of RAM uh no dedicated graphics <laughs> played San Andreas and um uh I I I yeah, figured out, well, of course I couldn't play San Andreas on Ubuntu, but I could still play RuneScape better. But yeah, like, I, I had figured out all this stuff on my own just to get better performance in a game. And now if you're a kid and you get an iPhone and you're playing Candy Crush, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no necessity. There's no necessity to try to figure out stuff and upgrade it. So yeah, there's this weird gap in, I guess, technological competency where... Um, it's like a bell curve, I guess, right? Where yeah. the the um, boomers are like over here, and then you've got the millennials and Gen X, and some of the zoomers in the middle, and then who oh boy, if you're if you're Gen Alpha and you're because Gen Alpha, I think is um, my nephew's Gen Alpha, and he's I think eleven or twelve, so they're they're starting to become teenagers, and I I really question how competent they are. <laughs> with uh, the more advanced technology stuff. Plus, so much of this is getting outsourced anyway. Like, I wouldn't even... I don't even think I would really recommend that my nephew look into IT as a career because he's got to compete with all of India. And I don't think enough corporations are getting burned by outsourcing. Although that new um, Cisco vulnerability, which isn't even really Cisco's fault. I mean, they enable the web console by default on their switches, which... I, there is an argument to be made against having that in an uh, enterprise environment. I mean, you're working in an enterprise environment right now, so... Yeah. Are you ever logging into a switch or a router via a web console, or are you just doing everything over your terminal, like SSH and stuff? Yeah, I, I do everything over a terminal. Um, I haven't done network admin at work since my okay. last job. Okay. Um, I'm only working on machines, but yeah, I do most of my work by a terminal. See, I did too. And I, whenever we had to like provision these network devices, I would do it over a terminal because I can plug in, like, I think our we had an eight port switch that was at our desk, so I could plug in eight phones or or eight, you know, any whichever device we were provisioning that day, and run a script. And it would automatically, like, you know, upload this uh, any file and then flash it. And it's so much faster than what some of the other people. I mean, there were some people that used the script once I told them about it because they were more comfortable on the command line. But other people would just go through a web console and they would actually just plug in. So they would plug in, say, a phone or something like that directly to their computer. 
and then flash the any files on it. And then they would also go in and say if the customer, some customers would want us to customize their DNS settings. So then you go in, you set like 8.8.8 .8 for the DNS server. And then, you know, you got to wait for it to finish and then you unplug it. They would do that manually and I would just be here, you know, okay, run the script and then I'm going to pretend like I'm working <laughs> for the next two hours because that's how long it's going to take you to flash uh, all those phones or all those app netters or whatever <laughs> manually. Do you do that as well? Do you have any of your colleagues that are just super slow and you just kind of match their pace while you goof off at work a bit? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I only work with another guy, um, so I, I, I have to basically. I'm like an IT person for engineers, so I have to deal with like pretty high levels of autism already. Um, but you got one of your guys uses Emacs, right? Yeah, dude. I that's the one thing I hate about engineers is like they're 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 so fucking specific about what they want. Like I, I shit you not, we have like I think four or five supported different text editors just because like one or two people were like, I've used this text editor for forty years and I wanna keep using it. It's like motherfucker, just use like Vim or Emacs or some shit. Like like I don't wanna have to support Emacs because your ass doesn't <laughs> wanna go learn how to use Vim. Um, so it's it's yeah, I've I've been there where I have to just automate shit and I just end up acting like I'm going to work. Like I just automated all the patching on my machines and then I don't have to do it manually anymore. I can't, uh, I can't wait till a new guy comes in and he demands to use Ed. <laughs> I, what was it? I have a guy who used, I mean, we use like VS Code, Vim, uh, Emacs, right? Yeah. Uh, GVim. I had one guy ask for Slick Edit, which is like this super ancient, not ancient, it's still updated, but like it's been around for a while. Uh, so we had to go out and like actually get that and support it. And it was like, why do all this work when you can just use Vim and uh, customize the key bindings? Um, That's wonderful. Yeah. All right. So getting back to our heckin' uh, tech news, man, we went on so many tangents there. Um, Hamas is apparently really good at making propaganda because they can just clip Arma and say it's them shooting down Israeli helicopters. I hope they clip some COD footage and say they have a nuke. But here's what, uh, here's what Hamas is not very good at, guys. They're bad at crypto. They're real, real bad at crypto. So this is actually something I posted to my Instagram, which uh, was a risky post looking back because <laughs> they might have thought that I'm promoting terrorism. But... um. I posted this, uh, so apparently there were these posters that were going up uh, around the Gaza, you know, Gaza Strip and um, in other places where, like, I think they were some in Turkey and some other places where you might uh, suspect a lot of terror or Hamas sympathizers to live. And there were basically posters telling people to donate in Monero to a Monero address, and the clip of the posters I had were censoring the Monero address, but, you know, it, it to me, I, what I posted on uh, Instagram was that it was a bullish signal that terrorists have figured out Monero, but they haven't figured out the crypto fundamentals, not your keys, not your coins. Israel froze 100 Binance accounts <laughs> over suspected Hamas links. And authorities have requested information on some two other crypto accounts. So, you know, these guys, I, I'm not sh sure if it's Hamas's actual crypto wallets or if it's people that have just been donating to Hamas via Binance. But I mean, this is insane. Why on earth would you go through a custodial wallet to send crypto to what, you know, else, what the media is calling a terrorist, okay? Like, regardless of how you see the, you know, Israel-Palestine conflict, I mean, I'm fairly neutral on it. I don't care. I'm American. But um, the media, right? The rest of the world sees these guys as terrorists. And in almost every country, if you are suspected of funding terrorists, they've got something like the Patriot Act, which means you don't get a trial. You don't get, you have no rights, Men in a van come to your house, they put a hood over your head, throw you in the back of that van, and you wake up 
in you know a place like Guantanamo Bay, one of those places where it's like this is U.S. soil, but it's technically not U.S. soil, so you don't have any all those rules where we can't torture you. That's gone. That's gone now. We can do whatever we want to you in order to get answers about you funding your terrorism. Why? Why would you do something like that through a a medium that required you to scan your real photo ID and give them your real social security number? I'm, I mean, this is a requirement of Binance. I'm pretty sure it's a requirement of almost every other um, non-decentralized crypto exchange. I mean, gosh. See, this is why I don't worry too much about like these high-level... Um, compromises that people talk about, like Tor getting compromised or like one of the Monero devs, the Monero project getting compromised because it's so much easier to just do this. It's, it's so much more likely that your adversary, if you're like the CIA or Hamas, or um, not Hamas, but like Mossad or whatever, it's so much more likely that their adversaries are going to make really stupid mistakes like this and they can just call up Binance uh, and freeze their accounts. And of course, Binance is going to do it because Israel is their greatest ally as well. I mean, are these accounts that, are these all, like, were they people who sent money to Hamas or was it just people who received uh, Monero? Well, let me read what they're saying here. Binance confirmed to Coindesk last week that it was working with Israeli authorities to block terror financing. The firm told the Financial Times that it had blocked a small number of accounts on the platform, but declined to say how many. And then this is a quote from Binance. We are deeply saddened by the events in the Middle East. As always, Binance follows internationally recognized sanctions rules, blocking the small number of accounts linked to illicit funds. We wish for a swift and peaceful end to the conflict and the safety of all innocent civilians. I, so I have to think if you're Hamas, right, you got to have someone who has at least some decent level of knowledge of cryptography and cryptocurrency, right? I mean, they, have, they can fire missiles, right? They obviously people who know how to handle ballistics. You people who can post social media, like they have people who are dedicated to like recruiting people on social media. So you have people who are technologically capable of doing that shit. So I'd like to think that they have someone who can do that shit. Uh, well, they had that kid. Well, this wasn't Hamas. This was ISIS. They had... Oh, wasn't that like the kid who built his own rocket? No, 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 no. I was, I was going to talk about the kid that was trying to build... Um, what was it? He was trying to make a custom... Linux distribution for using Gentoo for ISIS. Oh, right. I remember yeah. that story. So yeah. they arrested, they arrested their guy. Yeah. Their IT guys in jail. <laughs> that was the one guy that you was like, went, a, <laughs> you could just went to, uh, the fucking Gentoo wiki. But they don't know about, that's my point. The terrorists don't know about the Gentoo wiki and the one terrorist sympathizer that was technologically literate enough to probably help them with, Monero and using private wallets got arrested. So, yeah, but it, but then again, that doesn't necessarily mean that he knows a lot about crypto because cri even like cryptocurrency itself and like how to use cryptocurrency is not necessarily something that you would be. It's it's kind of its own, it's its own thing. And so many people, so many people seem to mess it up. I mean, I don't. I wonder if they know about Dread that because that's probably the best resource where it's an all-in-one place to get really, really good privacy tips about using crypto, to get tips about Tails or Cubes OS, and, like, learn about all this stuff in one spot. I don't know if they're on Dread, though. <laughs> they probably never yeah. heard of it. Yeah, going back to the technological competency of generations, I think that's part of the problem, is a lot of apps nowadays focus on convenience over customizability or modularity oh yeah right because like back yeah. in the day when you when you had like an app like say like irc right compared mm -hmm. to discord right yeah. there was much more modularity with with irc and how you could handle it because it was the clients were pretty soft and yeah. it was really just a protocol you couldn't you can communicate to anyone using irc using anything now like it's it's Discord or it's te like not Telegram because Tele uh, wait Telegram the client's open source right but the server isn't or am I getting that backwards? 
I think you're right. Yeah, Telegram, because there is okay. a there is an app called Telegram Foss. So I think the clients for Telegram are open source, but the um, the like server infrastructure isn't. It's not federated, so yeah. you can't you can't really run your own Telegram server. Yeah, like a lot of the big apps nowadays have proprietary protocols and their own proprietary clients, and proprietary servers, and they focus more on usability. Like you can sign up for an account and get working in three minutes. Oh yeah, you sacrifice I mean, a lot of the the stuff that you would normally get good at because yeah. they handle it for you. Big tech definitely um, wins, like compared to open source software, when it comes to well ease of use. I would say they're they're almost on par, but what I th where I think big tech really wins is in the sexiness of their applications because. And part of it is just the nature of it. Because if you take something like um, Apple, for example, so if you're using a Mac OS, like a MacBook, Mac OS, and you're using applications that are made from Apple, they're going to be the ones designing all of that UI. They can make it all seamlessly fit together. And then if you start getting into the whole ecosystem, so you've got a file on your MacBook that you want to send to your iPhone. I'm pretty sure you do that with AirDrop, right? Like it's set up in such a convenient way. It's such an easy to use thing and it looks good. Like the UI to it looks nice. So that's where I feel like they really win. I mean, if you compare, probably one of the better comparisons would be just compare the hardware of a ThinkPad to a MacBook. The MacBook, for the most part, is a sexier device. I mean, when I worked at Best Buy, I can't tell you how many college girls I sold MacBooks to because they're like, oh, I like this one, it's cute. <laughs> we never talked about RAM, we never talked about CPU speed, we never talked about anything that actually matters when it comes to the computer, you bought it because it's cute. Same thing with the iPhone, oh, I like this iPhone, it's cute. <laughs> And in the open source world, there's not as many uh, cute products that are going there. So, yeah, that's that's why people just go for the um, easy stuff and they uh, choose to be ignorant of their technology. That might be one of the reasons. I mean, as a former, you know, someone who's used who used Apple in the past, I, I will say the one thing is Apple has pretty okay security out of the box. Like what I mean by that is security from external threats, not counting Apple's own surveillance of their users, but like as far as, you know, antivirus protection, as far as it, like encryption by default goes, they actually are pretty good, like out of the box. Oh yeah. But you can obviously get more private and secure by using open source software, but they're not that bad. Like not as bad as like Windows would be. Oh no, I mean Windows, yeah. well actually it's, it's funny because Windows, I actually do have um, a computer with windows on it i i dual boot it but um i was looking around in the settings of it, it came with windows 11 it's my gigabyte laptop and it has they've got these things like core isolation and there's there's a lot of settings in windows that i think would make it much much harder to hack there was actually one setting that i turned on um and it made it it made things too secure so it was annoying <laughs> but um oh what's it called Folder protection. So this is a thing that's supposed to protect you from ransomware, I guess, is you can set which applications have write access to which folders. And I turned it off because I tried, um, like, I tried doing something, like I tried saving an something from GIMP, and it's like, oh no, GIMP can't write to this folder. <laughs> or I tried downloading something, it's like, oh, uh, Brave or Firefox can't write to your downloads folder. But um, that's not that's not on by default. But I think the core isolation is, and I think uh, it would probably be worth doing a video about a, a proper review of the security differences between Windows 10 and Windows 11. Because Windows 10 was the last OS that I used like really full time, and I switched to using it. Well, I switched to using Linux for several years, and then. I started getting interested in penetration testing and I've actually made malware. I mean, using automated stuff and kind of going in and doing minor programming to improve it. 
Uh, but I've made malware that's able to take over Windows 10 machines. So it might be maybe an interesting home lab experiment to see if I can come out with some malware that can actually take over a Windows 11 machine. Have you ever done that? I know you did some home lab stuff in the past, but did you ever get into the pen testing where you create Briefly. a payload and you execute it and see if you can um, like escalate privileges and things like that or see like what, what you're able to mess with before antivirus flags you? I did a lot of web hacking. I did a lot of web hacking. So I didn't do really any OS hacking. I did a lot of web ah. hacking. So I, I was able to like, like, I remember at one point, I, I, uh, what I used to do was like I get phishing emails, right? And I would try to actually like penetrate the, the phishing website. And at one point, I did manage to get like a, a list of accounts that were used that people submitted to that website. So like the guy had multiple websites that he would use. I had like a fake Microsoft login. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get into the back end of that website because he left the default credentials on, as usual. <laughs> I would probably automated, but I mean, like, come on, man. Um, and I was able to get a list of people, like their username and their password uh, to their Microsoft account. So that's so these kind are of... people that he fished? Or this yes. was the guy running the fish? No, oh, okay. people that he fished, yeah. Mm. So it was, that's, that's as far as I've gotten. Um, I've done some forensics on programs, like, you know, trying to uh, decompile stuff using, what is that? It's like that program. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, what's that, it called, Jidra, right? Isn't yeah, I that think. A decompiler? Uh, yeah, let me, let me look it up. I remember yeah. using it in college. Yeah. No, I never, I mean, I was just, you know, messing around with, uh... <laughs> <laughs> like literally put on a black hoodie, <laughs> play some synthwave music. <laughs> and let's play Hacker Man. But it was always really satisfying and, and it's I mean it's it's script kitty stuff, but if you're like I don't know, may, maybe if you combine just a little bit of programming knowledge beyond Oh it was IDA Pro. Kitty, That's what it was. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, like it was it was so crazy how because I, I didn't go through this is before I had a security plus. I mean, I don't even have any offensive security certificates. You know, I've got a plus network plus CCNA and security plus. None of that really covers making malware or any type of like red team stuff. But it was funny how the little bit of like Python knowledge and, and shell scripting knowledge and um uh, batch scripting knowledge that I had, I was able to create like some malware that could really wreck a Windows 10 machine's day. But Windows 11, I, I think, is a little bit better. But anyway, uh, our next topic actually still has to do with Microsoft. They're becoming, in my opinion, the Disney of gaming. And the reason I call them the Disney of gaming is Disney owns like, what is it, one quarter or like one third of all mainstream media like every movie because they own marvel they own star wars they obviously own disney and they own pixar right so anything that's a pixar movie is owned by disney if you go to the theaters almost all of those movies are being made by disney and now it's going to get to the point where when you go to gamestop almost all of those games are owned by microsoft because they completed the 69 billion, nice, takeover of Call of Duty maker Activision Blizzard, which I didn't even know before this recording that Activision and Blizzard were merged. I thought those were two still two separate companies. So, I mean, help me out here, because I think you're more of a gamer than me. What are some titles that were under Blizzard that they owed now? I guess World of Warcraft, right? Yeah, That's World of Warcraft. Title. That's uh, huge, they, I'm pretty sure. League of Legends, I think. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, um, um, oh, what's, th what's that game that everybody plays that's like a first person shooter team matchmaking one? Can't remember what it's called. It's not League of Legends. God, I feel like such a boomer. I don't know any video Over games. Oh, Overwatch? Yes, yes, Overwatch. Who owns Overwatch? Is I Microsoft on that it, now? I think it's Blizzard. Check it real I forget quick. if it's. You're yeah, my Google guy. It. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll read this article while uh, Mike looks it up. So uh, Microsoft, and they own the Xbox gaming console, so don't forget that. Yeah, right? it is they Blizzard. Own, 
It is Blizzard, Blizzard. yeah. So now they own Overwatch. Uh, Overwatch sucks. I'm a TO2 person. Um, and they own Call of Duty, right? That's that was made by Activision. I mean, at this point, it's like, what is a game franchise that they don't own? That's huge. I guess Pokemon. They're never going to get Pokemon. There's no way. Yeah, Nintendo probably isn't going to get bought or sold by anybody anytime soon. They're very independent. Yeah, but like... I saw a, a map, because <laughs> uh, we covered this in another show and there's like it, there was a graphic that was shown i think by microsoft that showed like all the brands they own and there's like a ton of uh of companies that they are development houses they now have under their under their control uh which is kind of insane i'm trying to find it i'll send it to you if i can find it but like now they they have games like overwatch like diablo call of duty warcraft uh they also uh i don't know if you know but blizzard is it Activision or Blizzard? I don't know which one owns, but they own uh, the mobile development company King. People who make Candy Crush. Oh so they yeah, have that yeah, too. right. So they're done, yeah, and that's they, they that's that a whole too. separate platform of like, because um, when it comes to freemium games, I think people still spend more on mobile than they do on any other platform. Because like the last um, the last mobile game I played was Clash of Clans. This is like almost 10 years ago, though. But I remember back then, all the top people, like your top 10 dudes on Clash of Clans were like, the joke was that they were oil princes because a lot of them had Arabic names. And, you know, you look at what they have at their base and you, you know that they're spending money on this game. They're buying, I think it was like gems or something like that. And not only are they spending money, but they're spending a shitload of money on this game because... With Clash of Clans, and I guess a lot of the other games are like this, you know, you upgrade um, your, like, walls and defenses and stuff of this, like, little base, and then you can also, people can attack your base, and then you can also buy these monsters to attack other people's bases, and there's, like, a, um, the point of attacking people's bases is you get coins, which you use to buy stuff and upgrade stuff, and you also get this purple stuff, I forget what the purpose of that was i think it had something to do with monsters like spawning monsters but anyway you get to a point in the game where you're at like level seven walls and in order to get enough coins to upgrade every part of your wall because it's like a grid system right so if you want to upgrade every single grid of your wall from like level seven to level eight because of the exponential increase of what it costs to do that it's either going to take you eight months of playing this game every day and checking it to make sure because you automatically farm coins and and the purple stuff and the idea is you want to spend this before somebody raids you because you can see if somebody's got a bunch of stuff in their base so it's you either keep playing the game and, you know, babysit it for eight months or you spend some money on gems and you can just upgrade all your shit right away. So when a I, new I, tier of walls comes out, like when, you know, level 13 walls get released and some dude whose name is all in Arabic has it the next day, it's like, yeah, you just spent five grand on pixels, dude. Arabic or Chinese. It's either. Yeah, or. yeah. Or Chinese. Yeah, it's always it's always one of those two. And it's like, damn, that's a huge money. And it's virtual stuff. It doesn't cost Microsoft anything to make that. So. Holy cow, man. They're the Disney of gaming. I just sent you an infographic. This is the one I used on my other, the other podcast that I'm on. Um, it's a good it's a good looking infographic, and it shows you everything that they now own. So they already own Bethesda, which are the guys who make like Fallout and uh, Skyrim or Elder Scrolls. Um, they already own their own stuff under Game Studios, so they have like, you know, the guys who make Minecraft, right? Mojang, they have... Um, the guys who make Forza, uh, they have, you know, Halo, people who make Halo, the 343, or Bungie, whatever it is. Uh, they just got Activision and Blizzard, so you have the guys who make Call of Duty, uh, they also make, oh, Activision mainly makes Call of Duty, but they also make, like, uh, the new Tony Hawk games that are coming out. Um, they, apparently Activision also owns MLG, like the MLG company that handles esports, so they're going to have their own esports division now. Um, then Blizzard has a shit ton of other 
games and companies they own. Most of them are always also online only games. So like things like Warcraft, Diablo, Overwatch, uh, Starcraft, uh, Hearthstone, like all those competitive games that are online service that make a shit ton of money from advertising and esports. And then it's not even mentioning the mobile division, which has a fuck ton of other stuff that is just like microtransaction hell. So they have a crap ton of stuff in their portfolio. Um, and I actually said this in the other podcast, was that uh, you, you don't play a lot of games, but on Windows, you oh, can buy... Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Did you say another podcast? You do another podcast? Oh, Holy shit, I forgot. Yeah, I think yeah. that's an opportunity to plug your podcast that, does, that doesn't that does get views on a podcast that does get views. <laughs> <laughs> I don't own it, so I don't really care about, about the show. <laughs> no, go for um, it. So my friend... This was like a couple months ago. Actually, no, it was like a year ago when I when I started uh, doing YouTube. He does his own thing called Six Seconds of Silence. Um, and it's kind of like this, except it's less techy uh, and a little less based. Yeah, but... it's like the Libre podcast if you bought the Libre podcast from Wish. <laughs> I like to say we're the great value version of, uh, of the Libre podcast, you know. Um, but yeah, if you want to check it out, you can check it out. But... We're, we're in Libre mode right now. Six seconds um, of silence, and that's on... Uh, what what platform is that on? Uh, YouTube right now, and I think it's also on Spotify. Whoa! So. YouTube and Spotify. Listen I to think. that, guys. I had to double check. I don't, I don't know if you put it on there yet. It's so on YouTube, it. and it might be on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, so, so professional if, stuff. So if you want to listen to a, uh, you know... There's there's a lot of great podcasts out there, right? There's the Joe Rogan Experience. Um, there's uh, the Libre Podcast. There's um, what's what's Theo Vaughn's podcast called? Oh damn, I'm blanking on it. It's like last Friday night or something like that. And then there's Six Seconds of Silence. Hey, look at that. These these are all these are all podcasts. <laughs> these are all indeed podcasts. All right, now despite Microsoft, um, you know, being basically richer than God. They owe 28.9 billion in back taxes to the Ooh. IRS. Now, okay, hang on a second. Are they going to pay those in uh, Xbox gift cards? <laughs> I sure hope they do, yeah, Xbox Live cards. Um, so here's the thing, right? Um, when you don't pay your taxes, that's illegal. That's against the law. You're not allowed to do that. I think... Um, was it Thomas Jefferson or Ben Franklin said there's only two things in this world that are inevitable, death and taxes? So how come, if I don't pay my taxes, men with guns come and put me in a cage? But when Microsoft doesn't pay their taxes, they get to use that extra money to acquire Activision and Blizzard and become the Disney of gaming. What's going on here? Why aren't they paying their taxes? 29, 20, the 28.9 billion in tax. I mean, if I just didn't pay, like, I mean, dude, I was getting, so, okay, here we go. Another, another IRL uh, piece of information. I was getting um, these tax letters sent to me from Massachusetts for not paying, um, I guess, vehicle tax on my... Mercedes, I don't even know, because I paid for registration, but I guess there's some other tax. I don't know. This is the first vehicle I've ever owned, even though I'm like almost 30, and I don't even own that vehicle now. <laughs> I traded it in for a uh, Toyota Tacoma, because I'm a sneeder. But, um, yeah, I kept getting this stuff from the state of Massachusetts. They're like, we're going to garnish your wages and, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> If you don't pay us these taxes, like just threatening letters and they were sending them to my address and my grandmother's address. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> and it's for like a hundred bucks. It's not even that much money. Like if, if I get threatening letters to pretty much every address that the IRS knows about that's related to me. For a hundred dollars, what, what are what do you think they do for Microsoft? <laughs> it's almost 30 billion. That's crazy. And it doesn't even seem like it's a lot because the market cap for Microsoft is $2.43 trillion. So it's what they owe is such a small percentage of the, the whole company's value. 
Yeah, I think if you're a business, though, it's it's a little more wonky because you can move that cash around, right? Because uh, you can like write off stuff on your taxes. Like you can, there's a lot of places you can move that cash to. If you're an individual, there really isn't a whole lot of places you can move that cash to unless you have the resources and the outlets to do so. Which is how Donnie gets away with doing it, is because he has a lot of outlets that he can move cash to that can deflect those taxes. If you're like just a YouTuber who makes six figures, there's really nothing you can move the, ta the cash to to avoid that tax. Yeah, well, that <laughs> it's it's funny you you bring up Trump because uh, that's getting shut down, right? Is it is it he being forced to auction off all of his properties in New York? Because he would yeah. pull these shenanigans where he would say like, uh, <laughs> "I've got this penthouse suite. It's the best penthouse suite. It's it's three thousand square feet." And then next year, uh, that was this, the one where he was. Uh, this penthouse suite is amazing. Was... It's thirty thousand square feet. <laughs> it's the best. The best. People are saying like, it, was, was, it was the one where he was like in trouble because he overvaluated shit, right? But but no, yeah, he overvalued. But here's the thing: he overvalued in ways that were objective. <laughs> he was like, I'm pretty sure he lied about square footage of places, and I'm pretty sure it was like to that order of magnitude where he's got something at three thousand square feet, and he says it's thirty, <laughs> and just no one's. But no one's. See, I can't even really blame him though. Because here's the deal, right? If I'm Donald Trump and I'm going to sell you an apartment building that's eight stories and I'm like, oh, this apartment building I have in New York, it's the best apartment building. It's it's 12 stories. I stopped right before 13 because, you know, 13 is a scary number. There's a lot of superstitious people out there. You know, 13, you set up a 13 story building, it might collapse. So it's it's 12 stories. And you pay me for a 12 story building. <laughs> and it's really six. Like... <laughs> I, like, come on! You know what I mean? Like, it's the same, it's the same thing with the scamming. It's like, if, if you fall for this crap, someone out there is going to get that bag, man. Okay? Like, there's people out there who, they they aren't, um, I guess, as moral or, or ethical when it comes to making money. And there's degrees to this, right? So, if, um, like, you take the Freedom Phone, <laughs> for example. Oh, so that's like, uh, what? That's some Chinese phone with like a custom ROM that's not even a de-Googled ROM or it's not even a ROM that's effective at keeping big tech from spying on you, right? But yeah, but it has the American flag wallpaper. It has the American flag wallpaper and I paid Candace Owens to promote it and Base Black Lady says buy the phone. I have to buy the phone. <laughs> so like it is a phone, but it's way overvalued for what it is. So there's there's so many different degrees to these scams and people fall for it, okay? The the same phone that Eric Prince is um promoting, uh what's that one called? The unplugged phone. Uh which is probably a honeypot. I mean, Eric Prince is what, ex Navy SEAL, he invented Blackwater, he, you know, probably hangs out at country clubs with CIA agents. And he's got a phone where he like rolled his own encryption and it's totally legit. And he also kind of did the whole, um, I don't even know if it's necessarily a right wing thing, the anti being anti-vax, but he, he tapped into that anti-vax crowd by saying there's a dating app on there. Uh, that's specifically made for unvaxxed people. Totally a hundred percent, not a honeypot. Totally not a honeypot. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's degrees to, to these scams, but my understanding is Trump's scams were just ridiculous, egregious, like on the level of saying something is many more thousands of square feet than it actually is. Or I don't think he literally sold an apartment building and said it was more floors than it actually is, but it's like that type of stuff. I think it was because he overvalued his property, right? But my, my, my reading into the situation was that the person bought it and it was it's not like that person actually suing him. It's like the state suing him for yeah. overvaluing it. But my problem with that is if I if I sell you right this water bottle, yeah. I say this water bottle is worth a hundred bucks, and then you agree and Hold. you purchase it. Right? Fucking, if if fucking, you fucking here, hundred bucks. I'll give it to you right now. Give me that water bottle. <laughs> if if you agree, yes, and you buy it for hundred bucks. So who was the who was defrauded in that situation? What? I was defrauded? Who? I'm calling the government. I'm calling the government to get you. The government this, is gonna come get you. This man defrauded me. <laughs> I'm just confused because I don't know who 
who was because if you're defrauded, there has to be some sort of loss of something, like loss of uh, profit or loss of revenue. I gotta hide my cash in a different place now. <laughs> like who who the fuck was uh who who the fuck was offended in this situation? I was, and the government yeah, needs I to was. get you. <laughs> you eat the rich. Yeah, I, th I think that is that is accurate, which, you know, if, if that is the case where it's like the, the government, well, it's, it's I mean, yeah, I, I don't think I'm really with that. Um, so let's move on to this next thing, which is uh, speaking of fake news, right? This is related to Trump. This is, um, well, just fake news, I guess, related to Trump. But these uh, headlines about like... <laughs> Big tech is who vets these? Okay, who vets headlines like Meta made its Llama 2 AI model open source because Zuck has balls? Okay. Is it open source? Is it? Okay, let's check. Let's check, right? So we've got um here is Meta's uh this is on Meta's website. So this is like if you're gonna use if you're gonna program for Llama, and they talk about how Llama outperforms GPT-3. Well, here's the thing, right? Normally when something's open source, you have some kind of license that's somewhere on it that says, oh, it's GPL, or it's BSD, or it's MIT. I don't see that there, right? Luckily, some dude on Hacker News was nice enough to throw together this Google Sheet where we can look at different large language models and um see things like their parameters see what organization made them and also see the license that made it okay so let's look up llama 2 and what is this it's under a non-fang license i haven't heard of that but i have a feeling it's more restrictive than mip bsd or apache 2 all these licenses that you're all these different ai models or large language models uh that you're seeing in green so it looks like there's a handful of them here that are more open. Let's uh, short sort this A to Z. Now, here's the thing, right? Obviously, none of these models have nearly as many uh, parameters as Llama or as GPT. Um, there's Open Llama, which looks like it might go up to 20 billion parameters. Let's see. Permissively licensed open source reproduction of Meta's AI Llama. So here we go, guys. Zuck does not have balls. Open LM Research does. And they're much bigger than Zuck's. And they're smoother. And they smell more pleasant. <laughs> so yeah, we've got, like, here you go, is an example of a large language model that is actually open, like you, the licensing is such that you can actually use this um, and like, I guess do more or less whatever you want with it, right? And this is the thing that we see people complaining about, or at least that we see uh, the media complaining about saying that, oh God, it's dangerous to let people have these large language models because, oh my gosh, they could... Like, what, what's the biggest thing that they're complaining about with the large language models? Because those, those don't produce the deepfakes, right? Large language models are the same as the deepfake. Or is it? I think the large language models are used for text. data processing. Yeah, data yeah. processing and text, yeah. Yeah, so... I've seen people using them to like cheat on tests. Like that's that's the new thing is that if you're yeah, a kid, and like write essays for you, yeah, that kind of shit. Yeah, like no one uses Spark Notes anymore. You use ChatGPT to like write your test. Although it's funny that you know that we came to this because my sister actually wanted me to take some kind of algebra test for one of her friends. And uh, apparently it wasn't really proctored or anything. Like they were saying, oh yeah, I could you know easily sign in and do the test for her. And I was about to do it, but it was 300 questions. And I don't want to answer 300. Like I can do algebra, but I don't want to answer 300 questions. And I was asking, why don't you just have ChatGPT do it? But she was saying it couldn't solve it. So either ChatGPT can't do algebra, unlikely, or my sister and her friend don't know how to work ChatGPT. That's probably the case. They're not that great with computers. Have you actually used ChatGPT in any 
uh, faculty? No, I haven't. Uh, I, I didn't really get in before it was as open as it was and try it out. The only ones I've messed with are uh, Stable Diffusion. Like I, To me, I like the artwork stuff because I'm actually pretty good at writing. Like, you know, I, I can write... I, I actually took a creative writing class in school. Um, I can write jokes. I'm pretty <laughs> pretty good at writing jokes. I can, like, make up creative stories and, like, poetry and stuff like that. But I can't draw for shit, so... For me, being able to describe what I want drawn, which I'm pretty good at, is um, way easier than me actually learning GIMP or Photoshop or like how to use a paintbrush or anything like that. So yeah, I tend to do the the um, like Stable Diffusion and uh, Dal Dale Four, I think, is the one that Bing has. Yeah. Yeah, I, I dug up an old Hotmail account to <laughs> log in, because you got to log in on Bing to use it. And, I, uh, I've used ChatGPT to, um, to look up shit, because I use some open source stuff at work. And uh, yeah, you can go through the community, right? You can go through the forums and like dig through forum posts to find your solution, or you can have ChatGPT do it for you. Um, mm. And that's, that's kind of where I, I think it's useful. Is that it's if you need to like research some shit uh, and you don't want to like do all the digging yourself, it, it can just give you like if I'm asking it, uh, like the specific thing I was asking it was like, can I do X in this open source software? And it was like, yeah, you can. Here's the way to do it. Um, rather than me spending, you know, two and a half hours trying to dig through forum posts to figure out if I can do it or not. So with that specific example, well, obviously it worked out good for you, but I, I would be real skeptical of using ChatGPT that way, and I'll tell you why. There's been a number of times that I've looked up random things, and I end up on some kind of forum. Actually, here's, here's a good example of one that I recently had to deal with. I was trying to figure out whether or not it is safe or a good idea to use pressure-treated wood to build a chicken coop. Now, the reason I was unsure of this is when you pressure treat wood, there's chemicals that they put in it that basically prevent bugs from eating it, and it also makes it more weather resistant and stuff like that. Now, at first, some of the answers I was seeing was that you can't keep chickens in like a pressure treated coop. Um, in fact, I don't think you can even use pressure treated wood at all on a livestock farm and be considered certified organic. So that might lead you to believe that it's not a good idea. However, I started looking into it deeper, right? I started doing much deeper research than um, what ChatGPT might do. And I started actually looking into like, okay, what chemicals are in modern treated wood and why is it a problem? And the conclusion that I came to was when you have pressure treated wood that is in contact with the ground and it is in one spot for a long period of time. So say if you had a stationary chicken coop or you were using pre like using pressure treated post for a fence. What's going to happen is copper is going to leach into your soil and it's going to put the copper. So it's not even a completely foreign material. Like copper is in soil. It's it's a it's a mineral but you don't want your copper levels to be too hot. So that's where it might become a problem. Um, but even then, like having high copper, it's, it's not like someone salting your field or it's not like you had an oil spill or toxic sludge, like it's, it's copper. It's not that big a deal. And in my case, it's not a problem at all because I like to build mobile chicken coops. And that's actually what this coop is gonna be. It's gonna be a chicken coop on wheels um, two caster wheels that swivel in the front and two stationary ones in the back, so kind of like a giant shopping cart uh, with chickens in it. <laughs> and it's going to get moved every day. So I'm never going to have any issue with copper leaching in my field, on my farm, because I move it every day. Now, I might not be able to still be considered certified organic, but... I honestly don't care about that because what I have found from, again, more research that you might not get on forums this is actually from 
uh, reading Joel Saladin's books and from watching him on, you know, TED Talks and various like documentaries he's done with on Polyface Farm is a lot of the stuff the FDA, like the FDA doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay, the FDA is not run by farmers. The FDA is dudes in suits that like might have read a book one day that told them the cow goes moo and they are the ones who tell you, you know, how to do farming. So that's my only, uh, I guess, skepticism about ChatGPT is it might give you something in a summary on a forum, but if you scroll down, if you actually went to that forum and you scroll down a bit, you'll probably find an answer from someone who's got a lot of flair on that forum. Like there's someone who really knows what they're talking about calling OP an idiot. <laughs> and ChatGPT might not make it there. So yeah, have you had any examples where ChatGPT got things horribly wrong, or has it been pretty good for you so far? Um, I think it's it's it hasn't like I haven't used it for exact answers, right? There 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 have been things where it obviously gets it wrong or it doesn't understand the context, but it like points me in the right direction as to what I should be looking at because like I'll ask it a question and then it's like oh you can do this this and this and then like it doesn't because I I know because I use the system that it doesn't work that way, hmm. right? But it tells me like this feature. It's like, oh, you can use uh, what was it? I was using. I was. I set up like um. I manage a compute farm, right? So I manage like a, a batch compute uh, for us. And one of the things I have to do is set up uh, reservations. People can like say, I need you know, five hundred gigs of byte, five hundred gigs of RAM, and like twenty four CPUs. Um, and it was telling me, oh, you can use this feature to like enable reservations. And I knew that wasn't true because there was a different feature that it was name was called but it was pointing me in the right direction because it was saying that you need to You know what? You actually just jogged my memory. I have used a uh, LLM before. There's one, I forget what it's called, but there's one for generating Rust code. I've used that. And just like you said, it'll, it'll generate your code, but it won't tell you what it does. Because I was, I was trying to play with it as a way to sort of like learn Rust better. Like I would try to build something really simple myself, like, oh, implement a calculator that can do addition subtraction multiplication division and run it and just see like oh you know what did i get compared to the ai is my solution better than the ai's um so yeah i i have used that but i i agree you can't get you can't get really detailed information from them and i don't know it might it might even cheapen the learning experience to a certain extent but this is a uh, this is one of the most impressive in my opinion ai stories that i've seen and it is this 21-year-old that used AI to decode a burnt and unopened Herculean or Herculeanium. So I guess that's from the Herculean. I don't, I don't know what this word means. But anyway, it's some old Greek stuff, some old Greek scroll that nobody knew about. And it was, you know, burnt. And I guess they didn't necessarily want to open it because they thought it would make it worse. He decoded it with AI. And uh, actually here. Let's just read what it says. Mount Vesuvius. Uh, oh, so this is from Pompeii. Okay, it's the city of Herculaneum. That's what it is. Okay, so yeah, when the Pompeii incident happened, um, it was buried for 2,000 years, then it was excavated in the 1700s, and people didn't want to undo the scrolls because, yeah, they would turn to ash. But this person... Um, is this the person or wait? No, that's not the person. That's just the person announcing it. Today, we are announcing a major breakthrough in the Vesuvius challenge. We have read the first word from an unopened 
Herculeanum scroll. The word is uh, some Greek mishmash that I can't read. <laughs> and it means purple dye or clothes of purple. Congratulations to 21 year old computer science student, Luke Barito, who is the first person to see this handwriting in nearly 2,000 years. He has won the $40,000 first letters prize for this world historical achievement. Yeah, like, this is something that no, nobody knew what it said before in the used AI to solve. I wonder if, oh God, I, I wish I, I knew what this was. There's some manuscript, I know people are probably listening to this and screaming it at my name, but there's, there's some manuscript out there that has not been deciphered. And some people say it's indecipherable and there's pictures in it of like these crazy plants that aren't real plants or no one's actually seen these plants before. I can't remember what it is, man. Damn. But anyway, I wonder if an AI would be able to decipher that because it's something that's been around for a long, long time. It's. Yes, that's what it is. The Voynich Manuscript. Oh. Yes. Oh, man. Yeah, the Voynich Manuscript. There we go. So do you think AI is going to ever decode that? It decoded this? It's a made-up language, right? Yeah, because this is at least a real language. <laughs> to come up with what it means, yeah. Yeah, right? Well, I, I, when did I first learn about the Voynich Manuscript? I think it was a Terrence McKenna talk that I first heard about it. <laughs> right, an ancient frog poster. Just made up the Voynich. Well, that's like, um... Like, uh... What was it? It wasn't Cicada. Cicada is something... But I don't think they ever figured out what Cicada was about. But there was there was some, like, internet scavenger hunt that was similar to Cicada that just ended up being a big nothing burger. <laughs> so I guess it, it might be something like that. It just really ends up being a giant shitpost. All right, so our next story is about Best Buy ceasing the selling of physical media, DVDs and Blu-ray media after the holidays. So if you want... To buy physical media at Best Buy, this is your last chance to do it. It goes away after that. Now, of course, I have a soft spot in my heart for Best Buy because I worked at there for so long. And uh, do you do you have a soft spot for Best Buy? Well, you were never really you were never really technically a blue shirt, right? You went straight to Geek Squad. Ah, see, I worked my way up the hard way. <laughs> I got into. Um, it was computers, the computers department at the Cambridge Mall. And then I think I was in computers the whole time and I transitioned from computers to Geek Squad because it's. <laughs> well, Geek Squad is just so much more chill than being in the because the, the main thing I didn't like about working at Best Buy was the pressure to sell stuff because the the sales goal was eight hundred dollars an hour and i think it eventually came up to a thousand dollars an hour uh working in computers and what i found was like this this kind of comes comes back to the whole like i guess ethics thing like i used to be really hung up about offering people the best buy credit card and the reason i was so hung up about it is because i have had and probably still have some family members that are in credit card debt. Like they've been, you know, they, they went deep into debt. Now I know now at this point, you know, now that I'm not such a young warthog anymore, that uh, credit cards, you can actually like not make money, but you can save money with credit cards, right? Like we were talking about this a few days ago about how um, you get certain percentages of cash back for buying gas, or you get a certain percentage in cash back for groceries. And it's like, that's literally, as long as you're not an idiot, 
and you pay off your entire balance with a credit card every... I do it just about every day um, so that I know it's not going to carry over or whatever. You end up saving money using a credit card versus using cash or using your debit card or anything else. But back then, I still kind of saw them as this evil thing. And I saw it as like kind of predatory to offer people credit cards to finance like a computer or something that they can't afford. But if you don't do that, if you don't have if you're not selling a MacBook every couple of hours, you're never going to hit your goal at Best Buy. And <laughs> the other thing that was annoying, too, is we all knew that, like everyone in Best Buy, like if you're actually trying to do your job, right, like if you're trying to hit those sales goals, and you're trying to get promotions and stuff like that. You usually end up coming up with a strategy, which is I'm going to hang out by the most expensive stuff in my department and I'm going to sell that to anyone who looks at it. And so you would just have. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what we did when we were in the computers department. We would camp the Apple section and we would sell Apple stuff and you'd have like. I don't know, some some lady or some person, some guy who it doesn't matter who is looking at like. The plastic case you know dell laptop and i mean it's an okay computer under the hood it's a quad core it's eight gigs of ram but it costs 400 bucks <laughs> oh dude if you're trying to open up a case to sell like a headphone or something no yeah, hell no. How am I going to sell it? Because first of all, I'm not even selling the hard drives to people. You know, I'm, I'm giving it to you. And nobody's going to come and ask me for a hard drive anyway. This is, my, this is Best Buy. If you know what a hard drive is, you ordered it online and you're getting it at store pickups so that you don't have to deal with my goofy ass trying to tell you about the Best Buy credit card for the nine millionth time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like at this point, it, it makes sense, you know, and, and it's not, I don't even really consider it predatory. It's just, you know, if you fuck up, that's on you. <laughs> If if you don't make your payment, if you don't make your payment, Citibank or whoever they do the credit card with will fuck you in the ass <laughs> with like 19% interest or whatever. Uh, but like the DVDs are gone. And, and I remember telling, well, I don't think you really remember the guy. I don't remember his name, but I remember there were these guys that would occasionally come in and like they have this routine where they would just kind of look through the bin of DVDs and one of them was actually kind of a cool... Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. His name almost came to me. But I just remember that he used to live in Southie. Because I remember when I was moving out, he knew this um, real estate gal that was in Southie that he was trying to, uh, you know, hook me up with an apartment. But anyway, like, it was an interesting dude to talk to. The dudes that perused the DVD bins were good people to kill time talking to if you were a blue shirt and you just didn't want the GM to harass you. It's like, I'm helping a customer. He's trying to find Babe too. This is an important transaction. <laughs> oh man, I was so overworking at that place. But yeah, man, physical media is going away. It's all, it's all streaming, which to most people, you know, that have good internet connections, I guess that's cool. But what about the people like me that trying to go to my farm and what let's say i have to stay out at the farm overnight because maybe there's a fox or a raccoon that's harassing my chickens so you're telling me that i have to sit there in my truck with a shotgun protecting my chickens streaming content well the best i'm gonna get is maybe 240p and still a few hiccups so yeah dvds man where do we go to get dvds now where do we go to get blu-rays
Hopefully at Walmart. Because there's not even a Best Buy near me, so this isn't even, I mean, I, I, I know that that is a real example of people out in, like, rural places needing physical media, but Best Buy isn't even where we would get them. I don't even know where the nearest Best Buy to me is, probably in Richmond. <laughs> this is like a two-hour drive so far. Yeah, so Best Buy is going to cease the selling of physical media, and probably a lot of other stores are going to follow the leader because nobody buys DVDs anymore. And the streaming sites are just going to start getting bigger and bigger. This was another interesting thing that I saw, which is YouTube is claiming the first ever lead over Netflix in teen viewership. So there's more teens watching YouTube. That's what this says. That's what the survey says. It also says that most teens prefer TikTok over Netflix. Oh really? I thought it would I thought it would be the other way around. But Netflix, here's the thing about Netflix though. Netflix is uh oh man, there's another one of those things where I don't know the word, but um Netflix has gotten to the point where it's it, you know how you would call any generic soda a coke or you call yeah, yeah. So it's gotten to the point now. Well, there's there's a I think there's a specific word for it that has to do with corporate dominance where a specific company becomes so popular that they start people start using its name to refer to things that like like chapstick, right? Every single chapstick is like, okay. So this is Burt's Bees, right? This is what I use, but this isn't chapstick. But if this was on a table, and I said, go get my chapstick. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You go get this. Yeah, but I don't use chapstick brand chapstick. So Netflix has gotten to the point where it's like, if, if it's like a euphemism for just watching something on the TV. Even if you're not watching Netflix, you could be watching Peacock or you could be watching Netflix and chill, right? That's a euphemism. It means we're gonna watch something on TV and I'm gonna see if I can get in your pants, right? It's, it's not called Prime Video and Chill. It's not called Paramount and Chill. It's not even called Watch TV and Chill. It's Netflix and Chill, regardless of what you're putting on. So that's why I'm impressed by that, because I thought Netflix was way, was way bigger than that. But um, yeah, let's get into the uh, percentages. So... Yeah, right. Investment Bank Piper Sandler's 46 semi-annual Generation Z survey of 9,193 U.S. teens via CNBC shows that par participants spend 29.1% of their daily video consumption time on YouTube, and Netflix was a close second at 28.7%. So they're not beating them out by a lot, but there's a slight margin. YouTube is more popular than Netflix, at least with the teen groups. Um, and they're saying that they've theorizing whether the change is due to content on YouTube improving and the streaming industry becoming increasingly competitive. Because, yeah, the price of Netflix is going up and up. And YouTube is, well, it's still free, but we're going to get into uh, some of the YouTube shenanigans. Uh, I think that might be one of our last topics for this podcast. Um, so yeah, TikTok. Actually, it looks like there's more people using. Oh, wait, no, percentage of daily use. So TikTok is 38.4% of the daily use. Holy cow. Oh, man. Oh, man, that app came out of nowhere and just took over. Just took over the teens' minds. I don't think I asked my nephew if he... I gotta figure out if my nephew uses a TikTok or not. Try to... Try to fix that. Nip that in the bud real quick. Yeah, so YouTube is um, really, like... <laughs> and they've been here before, uh, Netflix. So Netflix kind of came, I guess, got ahead of them, and now YouTube's pulling back in the lead. But... YouTube TV, which I assume is part of that uh, previously... Uh, that study that we were looking at where YouTube has become more popular amongst teens. 
which now cost $73 a month because <laughs> the price of YouTube TV and YouTube Premium just keeps going up. They've agreed to end the $600 less than cable ads. So this is what we've seen. And it's not just YouTube that's part of this problem. It's really all the stream platforms, especially Netflix, where they've been jacking up their prices again and again and again. And they cut down on things like account sharing with Netflix or with YouTube. It's the ad blocking that they've cut down on, which we're going to get into shortly. But it's gotten to the point now where I'm pretty sure streaming platforms, if you own more than or if you pay for probably more than three, you're paying more than you did for cable. I mean, do, do you pay for any stream platforms right now or do you know anyone who does? Okay, I think Mike stepped away. But anyway, um, with, uh, with YouTube TV, you're paying $73 a month. Netflix, I think, is up to like possibly $20 or $30 at this point. So right there, you're almost at $100. Um, Prime Video, I actually had Prime Video for a while and I canceled it. I think that was $19.99 a month. So yeah, like if you get to three or more subscriptions... I'm pretty sure you're going to end up paying more than you did for cable. But we were told it would be the opposite. We were told that cable was the old school thing. And we had, uh, what is it, that South Park episode where, you know, they, they're showing us the cable company guys. They know that you're fucked, so they just rub your nipple, they, their nipples when you complain about them. And with streaming services, yeah, there's a bunch of competition, but they all seem to pretty much be in agreement that we're all going to raise our prices around the same time. So yeah, YouTube TV is jacking up their prices, and YouTube is also rampantly blocking ad blockers. So this is <laughs> something that uh, you may have seen a notification of where YouTube shows you this uh, notification that, oh, YouTube doesn't allow ad blockers. You have to disable it in order to continue. And the reason we're looking at uBlock Origin is this is the most popular ad block um, add-on in existence right now, I'm pretty sure. And you can see how the development has been going, where they've been trying to... It's basically a game of cat and mouse, where the uBlock devs keep coming up with new ways to block ads and block ads in a stealthier way so that uh, they, you, know, you don't get flagged by YouTube. And I'm not even exactly sure how YouTube is detecting ad blockers. I mean, you can use, um, there's a couple of ways to detect add-ons. Maybe it's through the user agent, I'm not entirely sure. But you could have the add-on and then you might just have it disabled. I'm pretty sure that you can still use uBlock in that circumstance, or they can just make an update to the uBlock Origin software and find a new way around it. Let's actually look at the issues now. Let's see, are there any issues with YouTube blocking it? I'm not actually seeing any. Yeah, so there's one from back in 2018. So it looks like uBlock might actually be winning the battle against YouTube and ad blocking right now. Mhm. Mm they they actually just made a they actually just made another commit as we've been doing this podcast. Yeah, but this isn't, I don't think this is to do with, uh, it's a version change, um, but a very minor one. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see YouTube ultimately winning the ad blocking game because even if, even if they find a way to permanently block all the ad blockers. So there's no way that you can watch a YouTube video with Brave's ad blocker or with uBlock Origin or anything like that. Someone is going to go through, watch the video, remove ads on their end, 
and then create a torrent of it, if it's good enough for that. And the people who are making content that isn't good enough to put up with an ad are not going to see the views. That's, that's one scenario that I see playing out. Like, I don't, I don't think people are really going to put up with the ad blocking stuff, especially with YouTube jacking up the prices of YouTube premium. I think that's up to $30 now. I'm not sure. I, I remember reading something a while back that the price of YouTube premium had gone up, which is supposed to be how you avoid ad blockers. But I think this um, could get YouTube to lose its throne as the most popular blocking service amongst teens. I mean, assuming those teens are smart enough to figure out how to install these ad blockers. I know we were shitting on them earlier about not being the most competent people with uh, phones, but those of them who are. That's right. For every, for every YouTube ad that you see, we block it, but then we show you five of our own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whoever figures it out. I, you know, I genuinely wonder, because I, I feel like people are less, like kids, teenagers are less tech savvy now than they used to be. I wonder if, like, if you do go to high school and you are a pretty tech savvy person, like, do you end up being, do you end up being kind of cooler? Like, if people don't know how to pirate music, for example, there's some kid out there who can't afford Spotify. Right? Or is Spotify free? And you just listen to ads and deal with music. I don't even have a Spotify account, so I don't know how that works. But um, I'm sure there's someone out there who is in high school and like knows how to torrent music, and they're probably one of the only people in their class that knows how to do that, and they could hook you up. They could probably start... Well, people don't buy CDs anymore, do they? Yeah, because I was going to say you could probably you could start doing your own bootleg CD thing. Maybe you could just have like a. Well, nobody downloads stuff either, right? Everything's just in the cloud. So you'd have to make a bootleg streaming service. I guess that's why it died out, right? Why pirating media died out. Most people I would just prefer to use the cloud. You help them out. Yeah, I guess you could do that. I've heard of people running their own Plex servers where they... Yeah, but I don't know if how much money they're making off of that. It's got to be some. But I, how good are the margins on that, though? Because to run a server that streams video, I'd imagine that's pretty high-end. A lot of storage. Yeah. I probably could have done it at my place up, up north that I was staying at because I had a gigabit connection. And I mean, the Threadripper could definitely handle it. And I've got a... Uh, I actually still have to shuck some external drives. I've got a bunch of... Not really a really bunch. I think I've got like three or four... 20... Well, they're between like 14 and 20 terabyte drives. I would just go at, to Best Buy whenever they had a really good discount on that Easy Store stuff. And buy one of those. Oh yeah, I went with you one day, right? Didn't we both buy one? Yeah, man, I gotta get those into a into a computer. The desktop you gave me didn't have enough bays though. It's only got like three or four bays. I'm gonna do a DIY NAS. I want like eight bays. You know. So YouTube uh might end up getting dethroned by some competition, but it's not gonna be library because uh library is dead. They made this post on October the 19th, the end of library. Now, this is not the library blockchain. This is Library Inc. Because Library Inc., the company, lost a judgment to the federal government. They've got several million dollars in debt. 
and so they've you know pled to shut down they're probably bankrupt but what's happening to the library network right that's what they say here um, oh, actually, well, let's read what happened, what's happening to Library Inc. first. So Library Inc. has debts to the SEC, its legal team, and a private debtor that it cannot pay. Its assets, which include Odyssey, are being placed into receivership. At this, As of this post, all library executives, employees, and board members have resigned. All will be doing what is required to satisfy any extending legal requirements, but no more. So Odyssey... Sounds like it's um, pretty much up for sale, or it could easily become a different thing. It's um, probably not... Well, it might stay plugged in to the library network, because they could let Odyssey just continue running as is, but since it's like an asset that's, I guess, being used to sort of pay off these debts... Uh, you might start seeing a lot more ads on Odyssey to generate revenue in order to pay for that. Now, library, on the other hand, is, is fine. So we have this section, what's happening to library network. Fortunately, library is not our network. It's a decentralized network, and all the code powering it is open source. So the library network might die too. Decentralization isn't magic. It only works if enough people use it. Could library still swallow all digital publishing like we intended? Could this be the beginning of a descent into obscurity? Who knows? It's not like we're library experts. The truth is that even writing this post fills us with anxiety. Everything we say is being scrutinized by people with immense resources that aren't big fans of us, free speech, or any technology that enables dissent. If we violate another one of the United States' incredibly clear and easy to follow laws, we might end up in jail. It's sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> Some of you aren't good at that. <laughs> However, we get into the game by being honest in the cryptocurrency space when few were. We got into the game by being honest. We then got into trouble for being so honest. It only makes sense to go out the same way. It's in our nature. So what's happening to Odyssey, which is the flagship library app, continues to serve more than 6 million people each month, even while it's been iced. CoinGecko rates Odyssey as the most popular Web3 social media site in the world, and it's by a large margin. Apparently, the second most popular is Steemit, and they've only got 3 million monthly users compared to the over 6 million that uh, Odyssey is now claiming, according to this CoinGecko. This is from January to April 2023, so it's been going up. Odyssey's popularity makes it the most valuable asset of Library Inc. While it's nearly certain the Odyssey assets will be assumed by someone interested in resuming its growth, it's unclear if Odyssey will continue to use the library network in the future. So this is what, what I was um, kind of talking about, where uh, Odyssey is going to continue on, and it's you know most likely going to be used to continue generating revenue, but it's probably not going to be the same thing as it was. Uh, it might not even necessarily continue using the library protocol in the future. It could switch to another cryptocurrency, or it could try to become a traditional Web2 platform like YouTube is. And um, they've got uh, weekly Odyssey user data here for data nerds. So this is showing... Um, let's see, 9-1... Um, I believe it was, yeah, so go to the section where it says, is the library token still a security? I'm pretty sure that's what it was over. Yeah, they, they don't, something, something like that. Um, it's, it's been a while since I read that, but it had something to do with what the library token was called. And I, I think they sold a bunch of library token as a startup to like get startup capital. I think that was like the big thing that the SEC was upset about. Um, so yeah, it, Odyssey is, uh, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen to it. I mean, it it's probably, what I think is gonna happen to it is it's gonna become more monetized because that's the whole point of Odyssey being sold off. 
I don't know if it's going to continue being plugged into the library. I don't know how that monetization is going to take place. Um, I'm not aware of Odyssey really putting any effort into stopping people using ad blockers. I don't even get that many ads on Odyssey anyway, at least not compared to YouTube. So here we see what happens to library channels and content. So there's over 17 or 1,700,000 identities and 30 million pieces of content that have been published to the library blockchain. As long as the library blockchain continues to be mined, those identities and records will continue to exist. But the content itself isn't published on the blockchain and it requires host nodes to function. So if Odyssey chooses to stop utilizing a library, then content that is not actively seeded by others will stop being available. So this is where the opportunity to bring back, I mean, it's not going to be Odyssey, but to bring back library. Okay, so to recap, Odyssey, you can sort of think, or yeah, Odyssey, you can think of as the front end and library is the back end. So the back end still exists. And the back end is going to continue fun. There's no way that the SEC can really shut down the back end because the blockchain is ungovernable. But without those host nodes actually seeding people's content, library is effectively going to die because you're just going to have identities out there. So like you'll be able to see the mental outlaw or, or alpha nerd on Odyssey but you won't be able to see the content if people aren't seeding it. So it's, it's really going to be up to the community. And what I think is going to happen is only if library survives, only the best content is going to survive. All the stuff that's not... If, if someone is out there making content that's not good enough for it to occupy some space on your hard drive or occupy some space on some of their fans' hard drives and occupy some of their bandwidth, it's gone. It's done. And Odyssey, I honestly don't know what's going to happen with Odyssey, guys. RP won or is winning the, uh, case, their case against the SEC. Like, that's something years ago where um, XRP, well, XRP, I think, is still one of the largest uh, cryptocurrencies by market cap, but it used to be a much bigger project, and then it got kind of in this weird limbo stage with you know, the SEC regulations, but now it seems like they're coming back around on there. Um, yeah, I, I think it's going to end up being, it's, I think it's going to have to be community seeding because um, they say they've got 30 million pieces of content that have been published to the library blockchain. So I would say... Let's be really generous. Let's say that the average piece of content is 20 megs in size. So 30 million pieces, that's 600 terabytes of uh, space, I'm pretty sure, to store that, right? 600 million megabytes would be 60 terabytes. So. Uh, if you're a nonprofit that needs to run 60 terabytes and stream that, uh, I don't see it happening, man. I don't, I don't see it coming from a nonprofit. Maybe decentralized, but no way it's coming from a nonprofit. And then if it's just decentralized, well, if it's just decentralized, you might be able to have a nonprofit to build a front end like Odyssey for it. Because most people who use... Most people aren't using the library app, they're using Odyssey. They're using some kind of front end. So maybe you could do that, but I don't know how expensive it is to run something like Odyssey to be able to just... Uh... Yeah, so probably a hundred, a couple hundred bucks a month, maybe. It's like, you know, it's, it's one of those things where... Uh, you gotta really like free speech and have a lot of disposable income to put towards it to to keep something like this running. So yeah, I'm I'm sad to see this. I mean, I guess I'm just gonna have to wait and see how it goes and uh, whether or not I'm gonna keep promoting Odyssey because I don't even tell people to subscribe to me on YouTube. I I only told people to subscribe to me on Odyssey, and 
It's been paying off because I think um, I was looking at the well, this was the library stats and my channel past Donald Trump's official channel, um, which that was like kind of pretty cool because, you know, I, I think he's banned from YouTube. So if he does make some content, I guess he has to put it on Odyssey. Um, yeah, man. That's too bad. Maybe we're going to have to start creating on Rumble. <laughs> I don't even really know too much about Rumble. I know one of um, the Predator Catcher guy I was talking about before, he posts a lot of con content out on Rumble. Yeah, it's... Oh, really? Okay. Jeez. <laughs> okay. I mean, hey, that that works. That works. Yeah, I mean, that. well, that's that goes with all the banning and stuff. Obviously, if you're going to ban people for stuff, then they're going to go wherever they're accepted. All right, I think... <coughs> I think this is our last story about the biggest DDoS of all time generated by protocol um, in... HTTP 2. Did you hear about that? Literally the biggest DDoS of all time. Let me see if it... Uh, let's see. So, an attack on Google on a site using Google's cloud infrastructure topped out at 398 million requests per second. That's a hell of a DDoS. But can you imagine? Almost... Yep. <laughs> so HTTP2 slash rapid reset is a novel technique for waging DDoS of an unprecedented magnitude. It wasn't discovered until after it was already being exploited to deliver record-breaking DDoSs. One attack on a customer using the Cloudflare content delivery network peaked at 201 million requests per second, almost triple the previous cloud previous record Cloudflare had seen of 71 million <laughs> requests per second. So right out the gate, it's like three, it's triple whatever they had seen. And um, I saw the one about Google successfully mitigating it because that one that I was telling you where it was 398 million requests per second, that's almost eight times bigger than Google's previous record that they mitigated of 46 million. And um it was coming from a network, the one that hit Cloudflare was coming from a network of 20,000 machines. So 20,000 machines producing almost 400 million requests per second. Well, relatively small for the amount of requests that they're putting out, right? Because let's see, 20 million and we're sending almost, let's call it 400 million to make the math easier. That's 40,000 requests per second from each machine, right? I think so. We're going to say that's right. And uh, that's, that's quite a bit more than you would normally get with a botnet. Um, and this one was actually able to uh creates like some 400 500 errors on websites even though people are using cloudflare so it's like cloudflare actually did get overwhelmed uh to some extent so the vulnerability that http2 rapid reset exploits resides in http2 which went into effect in 2015 and it's undergone several overhauls since then um let's see i don't know if they actually really tell us how to do this particular exploit um, falls into a type of DDoS known as application layer attacks. Okay, so it is at the application layer. Rather than trying to overwhelm the incoming connection to exhaust the routing infrastructure, application levels attempt to exhaust the computing resources. Okay, so basically they're, they're hitting, this is actually what happened to my website when I first launched it. And um, I forgot to migrate it to from the test server to the real server, where I was getting um, like uh, I was getting too many API requests, 
and I had it hosted on a single core processor. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, there's a thousand people trying to access my poor. And it wasn't even, uh, it wasn't even single core, it was a vCPU. <laughs> so when I first launched v base.web, it was on a vCPU and that's why um, the website went down. Cause like, you know, most of the time when I publish a video, it'll get like 10,000 views within the first hour. So all those people were like hitting my website. <laughs> And I'm sure there were some people that were probably trying to DDoS me on purpose and like just be shitty. But yeah, um, it overwhelmed the... If that gets to your server, it doesn't matter what you're using to run your server. Like your CPU percentage is going to peak to 100% and you're going to get those uh, 400, 500 errors. Wow. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's pretty nuts. So let's see uh, how it ended up getting mitigated. Um, of errors. Just about the idea of rapid reset attack is viable on an array. Oh, so they thought it wasn't even something that was possible to do, and they managed to pull it off. Yeah, I mean that's that's something that's going to have to be mitigated because twenty thousand malicious machines to take down sites that are using Cloudflare. That's almost the same number of machines that have been compromised by that Cisco, um, what is it, the Web API <laughs> takeover exploit. 10 out of 10 critical if you've got, what is it, Web API enabled on a Cisco device and that Web API is bound to a public IP or, or any IP where an attacker can see it, they're able to take over uh if it's bound to the http server that's that's the the key part so if you have an http server with that uh web ui on it mounted to a public or um even if it's a local ip and you've got someone in the office that feels like being a hacker man they can take that over so you could uh if you were controlling those machines and you have uh other servers that are vulnerable to this http2 vulnerability you could actually take them down even if they're using cloudflare <laughs> holy moly the worst ddos attack in history and one of the most like retarded <laughs> router exploits ended up coming out in about the same couple of weeks all right guys we are at uh just over the two hour mark so i think that that's a good time to wrap Oh, that's what that was? All right, cool. Well, yeah, that's it for this episode of the Libre Podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed. Be sure to like and share to hack the algorithm. Uh, follow me on Odyssey if they're still going to be around. And have a great rest of your day.